Um, on behalf of uh, Daniel Powell and myself, welcome to the performance scalability track. Um, we would like to thank our sponsors, um, Diamond Sponsors Facebook, Platinum Sponsors IBM, Gold Sponsors Arm and Microsoft, Silver Sponsors AWS, Amazon, Netflix, and Red Hat, and the speaker gift from Colabora. T-shirt sponsor is VMware, Conference Services, the Linux Foundation, and I'm sure you can read all that as to how to be a decent human being. Um, yeah, that, the idea of, of this is to, to, to have a uh, debate, try to upstream things that have not yet been upstreamed, and um, depending on, on, on the, the speaker, um, he might or she might let you uh, interrupt uh, at any moment um, or leave really questions for later, but the, the idea of this is to, to generate debate. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it off to, to Yang with the first presentation. Jack, uh, there we go. Yeah, now I can uh, control it. Um, there, I, I, I gave you um, presenting permissions, like, so you should be able to take it from here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, now, now I can uh, operate on it. Uh, sorry, it, it appeared it had not displayed for me. Uh, So you can't see the slides, Yang? Uh, it's oh yeah, yeah. I can I can see it now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, sorry. Good. Uh, 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 sorry. We can the, hear you. The okay. Network status uh, isn't very well. Uh, okay. Great. Okay. Cool. I will let you get okay. started then. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh sorry because. Oh, my network uh, connection status isn't very well. Uh, I will uh, I will present without uh, camera. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for uh, join our discussion about uh, optimizing page placement in tired memory system. Uh, so. Uh, so today we will talk about uh, some, firstly, some background about memory tearing, uh, then about uh, the most uh, code pages from DRAM to PMAM where uh, something like uh, migrating in lieu of discard and promote the hot PMAM pages to DRAM with new balancing and the to-dos, uh, the evaluation and uh, some uh, alternative implementation. I guess I can fill a little bit of time while getting something back on. Um, so yeah, I, in general, we have these new pieces of hardware with different kinds of memory. And so um, we've been up to this point using plain old NUMA APIs to let people move memory around between these different types because some of them are faster, some of them are slower than we've traditionally had. So um, Ying's agenda here is to talk about some of the things we're doing inside of the kernel to make, uh, to make these things better. Right now, we've been relying on user space, but uh, you know, user space doesn't, for instance, swap pages uh, historically. So um, we figured we'd uh, add something to the kernel that would let you uh, um, let your applications kind of continue to be um, unaware of the, these tiering setups uh, and still get some of the benefits of them. So um, a couple different approaches here that Ying is going to go through, hopefully. Um, is Ying back yet? Otherwise, um, if you give me presenting rights, I'm happy to go through, um, especially the uh, uh, the overview and the and the uh, the discard portions. Uh, 
So. So I see that he's in the room, but his um, bars are pretty weak. So I'm going to go ahead and, and hand it over to you, Dave, if that's OK, unless okay. we hear from Ying. All right, so I'm going to make you presenter right now. You okay. should be I able see. to control the slides at this point. There you go. Yep. I can control them. Great, thanks. Okay, um, so historically what happened is that all RAM on our systems were DRAM. Everything was pretty much the same. You know, we had NUMA systems, and so the RAM may have had different locations, but all RAM was DRAM, all of it was the same, nothing was different. And recently we started to get some, some changes to this. So we've got persistent memory, which is uh, um, uh, a new member in the hierarchy. It's, uh, it's great, uh, it's cheap, uh, and there's lots of it in systems, but it's relatively slow, especially on writes. There's also high bandwidth memory. We've had a couple different versions of this over the years. Um, and this exists on other platforms, uh, you know, other than x86. But, um, but essentially, it's closer to the TPU, but it's really expensive. Um, and there isn't very much of it on the systems. And then the newest emergent thing that's happening is CXL. This is essentially uh, fast PCI devices. But the cool thing about these, they're now cache coherent. And so you can throw some persistent memory on one of these devices <clears throat> or throw some DRAM on them. And you can expand system memory just by which is with a plug-in card. It'll look external like PCI, but you can plug it into a system and use it like RAM. So pretty neat stuff. So essentially what we have is a new a new member in the hierarchy between you know the CPU cache and storage. Traditionally DRAM was the only thing in here, but now we have you know things above DRAM and below. This picture just shows PMEM, but but essentially we have two new uh, you know, we have things that are both faster and slower than DRAM that are showing up. So um, uh, this is also an example of what we do right now in the hardware. So on the left side here, we have- uh, uh, Hello, Dave. Uh, sorry. Uh, hey, Ying. Uh, if your audio is back, feel free to take back over. Uh, Zach, Zach Stav uh, for help. So, so, uh, uh, just <laughs> uh, Zach. So yeah, uh, I, I will continue. Sorry for my network. Uh, connection status isn't well, uh, isn't stable. Uh, so Very yeah, we, we have memory mode uh, that it is uh, fully uh, transparent to OS. Uh, it, it has good enough performance uh, for some use case. Uh, the hardware, uh, in fact, the memory controller uh, will control the page placement. So there is no page, no page placement control from OS or application. So it had lowest complexity, lowest barrier to adoption. Uh, you will lose the DRAM capacity and the, the PMEM can only be used at volatile memory. And uh, we also have APB direct mode, uh, which is fully non-transparent. Uh, the application will control the uh, placement. So uh, because the application may know better about uh, which page is hot, so it, it may have best performance uh, and uh, in the same time it, it, it has highest complexity, the highest barrier to adoption. The DRAM capacity is maintained, uh, the PMAM can be used uh, as persistent memory. Uh, what we uh, proposed in this slide, in this talk is uh, uh, something in the middle, the memory tire mode uh, where uh, the OS will choose the default placement, so the placement can be transparent to application, but uh, uh, the system admin or application uh, can also override the uh, default placement. So uh, it, it can replace if you direct mode except uh, uh, persistent. It has low barrier to adoption, the DRAM capacity is maintained uh, and uh, uh, the PMAM can be only used as volatile memory. Uh, so for the optimizing target, uh, we want to optimize the page placement uh, automatically. Uh, that put all uh, hot pages in DRAM and code pages in PMAM. Uh, it should be should respond quickly enough to access pattern changing. Uh, it, it can. Uh, it needs to balance between the overhead and the accuracy. Uh, 
it should be manageable. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, may, we may partition DRAM among workloads. Uh, it should be flexible, so applications can override the default page placement. Uh, yeah, to, uh, this is about to represent the, the PMAM. So for, uh, for example, for a system with two socket, uh, we will put the CPU and DRAM in one in one node, uh, just as before. Uh, but for the uh, PMAM in the same socket, we will represent as a separate NUMA node. Uh, in this way, we can use the existing uh, NUMA API to manage uh, PMAM, and uh, we can take advantage of some existing NUMA mechanism, for example, NUMA balancing, or the array, uh, or the per NUMA node array list, uh, which we will use in, uh, in later. So uh, Ying, one uh, is still is still here. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I just uh, dropped that. Okay. Yeah. So Ying, one question here. So uh, okay. with the CXL, uh, how this figure will change? Uh, so yeah, we will we will put PMM in move out. Okay. Ying, uh, I, I didn't hear the answer. You dropped out for a second in the middle of a sentence. Uh, sorry, the, the the audio quality isn't uh, good uh, for me to to get the idea. So uh, maybe we can go back to to hear uh, later. Sorry about that. It, it, my my, I think it's because of my network uh, status. Uh, so about to uh, demote the code DRAM pages to uh, PMAM. Uh, yeah, it, uh, we leverage the uh, page reclaiming when there are the, uh, when there is uh, man pressure in DRAM node, uh, the page reclaiming will be started uh, and it, it will identify code pages in DRAM and try to uh, but uh, uh, before, uh, instead of discard these code pages, uh, we will try to migrate these pages from DRAM to PMAM. Uh, the the ARIO algorithm used by page reclaiming is good at identifying code pages. So, uh, so far in test, uh, this solution works uh, quite well. And uh, even for the further potential page reclaiming algorithm improvement. For example, the multi-generational ARU algorithm, uh, we, we can uh, take, take advantage of it. Uh, the, 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 the basic part of uh, the, the, the uh, the motion uh, has just been merged by uh, AFGIM kernel uh, or 5.15. Uh, uh, hey Yang, um, can, we, can we just go back to the previous slide? Um, so the, the the whole migration loop discard is, is, is kind of interesting. Um, because... Oh, sorry, sorry, Matthew. Uh, I think because of my uh net, net network status i cannot uh, hear your question clearly enough so perhaps sorry, i should tell you about that 
if you want to go ahead and ask Matthew, go ahead and I'll uh, launch it back to the as well. Okay, go back to Trevor Smith. Matthew, you can go ahead and ask the question. Okay, it, 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 so I'm 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 worrying that um, we're we're actually going to be slowing down some some workloads by you know ha moving pages around the active list and then copying them over to PMEM and then copying them to storage again. I kind of feel like we might be better to use PMEM as a victim cache. So when we're going to uh, get rid of a page, we write it to swap and to PMEM, uh, and then we re we retrieve it from PMEM if it's still there when it's going to become active again. Matthew, I believe that's how it actually it works exactly. So the place we plugged oh. into the to the VM here is right at the point when we would have decided that there are no more references to the page and thrown it away. So actually, swap space has been allocated, and the writes um, should have been started by the time we go do this. So um, it actually it's clean and ready to be discarded. And so it's just to the point that we would have thrown the page away that we copy it. So it's actually in swap for anonymous memory. Okay. So that has some downsides, but it is how it works right now. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, 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 obviously, I think that's a legitimate way to do it because that, that was what I was just suggesting. Uh, um, so when we come to uh, reactivate that page, so it's referenced again, do we leave the data in PMEM or do we migrate it back to DRAM? I think what was merged so far doesn't have the promotion part. Yeah, Matthew, right now it will stay in PMM. It, uh, it's lazy about it, so it's stuck. And we know that's a problem, and that's what Ying's going to talk about in terms of what we're proposing to rectify the problem of it getting stuck in PMM. Uh, okay. The only way right now it would get promoted back to DRAM is if it went um, down into swap, and then the swap cache page got evicted out of PMM. And then it got faulted back in from swap. It would tend to go back to DRAM. That's the only way it can happen now. That's not great, and that's what Ying's going to talk about fixing. Cool. Uh, I, I kind of uh, so so uh, Matt, you, you said that it will slow down um, uh, to do it proactively, but um, uh, so what can happen is that uh, we can have. Uh, 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 like uh, once DRAM is full and when we like have a s sudden uh, spike in allocation, we will we, we would have to start moving lots of pages to the PMAM, which will also slow down, right? Uh, so PMAM is much larger, and I think it makes sense to proactively move uh, rarely accessed pages to PMAM instead of waiting for like memory pressure for uh, for swapping to to start. That's a good question, I mean, but I think it's kind of orthogonal to this because right now we're pretty much saying we're going to take what the VM does and we're going to do this little tweak to its behavior. What you're talking about is something, I mean, we've talked about proactive reclaim and, and you know, user control of the, um, of the reclaim process, like um, with the multi-gen LRU or the other things people have done. I look at those as being really orthogonal. Um, you know, there's lots of other things we could do to the VM in general. Um, we can act, we can use them with these memory tiering systems, but uh, I think those are kind of orthogonal problems. So, uh, Dave, uh, one question I have is more uh, in the, so currently, uh, since it depends on the reclaim, it's only looking at the LRU pages. I'm wondering, is there a plan or uh, like uh, to look at the, like either unevictable LRU pages or uh, like non-LRU pages, uh, like HTLB and stuff? People have asked about it. Um, I didn't have any immediate plans to go look at it, but people have asked about it. Um, I've told them you should be a fest there. Um, <laughs> switch to THP if you care. So um, that answer has worked so far. So no plans, but we could be talked into it. Uh, Matthew, could you then uh, please uh, re repeat your initial question? I, I might have misunderstood your uh, first 
the question regarding this diagram right here. So, so this diagram confused me because what, what this diagram is saying to me is that when the page becomes inactive, we migrate it to PMEM. And then once the page becomes inactive on PMEM, we migrate it to storage. And that isn't what's happening at all. So I, you know, I, the, the, this slide just confused me. That's all. I see. I, I got it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point, Matthew. It really, it, uh, yeah, it actually kind of hits storage first, it, well, probably hits storage first before it goes to BMAM. So you're right, it's like, it's kind of from a very high level how we think of it, but it isn't how it happens in practice for sure. Ying, are you back? You're probably welcome to keep going. But uh, Dave, but for the uh, long uh, page, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I'm but back. for a long page, we do actually go to PMAN first, right? And uh, at least a patch set will go to PMAN first, then swap to disk. Is that correct? Well, I hope I'm not forgetting what what actually got merged. Um, but if I remember correctly, um, the point when it decides to do the migration is at the point when the last reference to the page would have gone away. So instead of having that last reference go away and us actually freeing the page, we we do the migrate pages at that point. So at that point, the page is in the swap cache, um, has been written to disk, is clean, and uh, uh, and that's when we demote it. If I remember correctly, because people have also complained that it does require swap and swap activity for the demotion to occur. So um, now it's it's possible it changed and I and I've forgotten about it. I remember an old version, but that's my recollection of how it worked. Okay, Dave, I don't think you remember correctly. I think the anonymous page just uh, got migrated to PMAN. No, no matter it's in, uh, it doesn't go to swap cache at all. Okay, totally possible. Uh, okay, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, I can ask your all your words uh, clearly or, or in time. <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, for the to-dos, uh, now we will just uh, have the basic part of the migrate in your discard uh, merged by the latest uh, upstream uh, 5.15. Uh, yeah, uh, we still have some to-dos for, for, for the motion. Uh, firstly, we, we cannot discard the eviction pages, but we may migrate them to PMAM. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, we, we have some reclaimable but unmovable pages, for example, the inode, B entry, cache. Uh, but, uh, because we can migrate the, uh, for example, another page of file caches, uh, it, it appears that uh, uh, we can uh, think about how to deal with the, the, the reclaimable pages in this situation, maybe lower the, the scan priority or something like that. Uh, and we lose the report feedback uh, because we uh, migrate the pages instead of make uh, swap them. Uh, we, we may think about how to uh, re retain the report feedback. Uh, yeah, we, we cannot uh, uh, discard huge TRV FS pages too, but uh, we may consider is it possible to migrate them and some you know, policy information isn't available during uh, page demotion, page reclaiming, but uh, uh, we we uh, we may think about how to uh, comply the new policy uh, as much as possible or, or, uh, during the demotion. Uh, 
so uh, about uh, the promotion, uh, uh, we, we do that with Neymar balancing. Uh, for some background, Neymar balancing is used to bal uh, reduce the cross socket uh, memory access. Uh, it, it will scan the page tables of all it makes page inaccessible. So later when a page is accessed, uh, the new marking page fault will, will occur. And if the page is identified as remote and uh, uh, it, it is not shared by uh, multiple socket, it will be migrated to the local node. Uh, because we uh, represent the PMAM in a separate node, so all PMAM accesses will be uh, considered remote access. Uh, so when we uh, access a PMAM page, we, uh, we will try to uh, promote it to DRAM. Uh, so the or originally, original neural balancing uh, works for the PMAM uh, naturally, uh, but there are still some uh, problem. Uh, first of all, uh, what is the DRAM is for? And uh, uh, in this way, we promote the most recently accessed pages, but uh, uh, whether these pages are hot? Uh, so first of all, about the uh, DRAM is for problem. Uh, when the uh, free pages uh, in a DRAM zone is higher than the hybrid mark, uh, we will promote the hot PMAM pages to this uh, DRAM zone or, or DRAM node. Uh, but uh, if the uh, free pages of the DRAM zone is lower than the hybrid mark, uh, we will weak off the key swap D of DRAM node. Uh, and uh, we change the key swap D so that in this situation, uh, the, the uh, key swap D of DRAM node will reclaim the more uh, reclaimed so that the uh, free pages uh, of the, the DRAM zone will be higher than uh, not only the high watermark, but also the promote watermark. The promote watermark, watermark is higher than the high watermark. So in this way, uh, we demote and promote pages between the high watermark and the promote watermark. Uh, so if, if there are heavy uh, man pressure in DRAM node, uh, we uh, we will stop promotion so that uh, we, we can leave the uh, free pages between uh, lower than high watermark for the uh, high memory pressure. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the promotion, uh, so this with the promotion will not uh, uh, make the, the memory pressure uh, too high, too heavy. Uh, so I think this kind of balance between the DRAM utilization and the MAM pressure. So if you want more uh, memory, uh, free memory, you can use the, you, you can read the uh, high watermark or something like that. Uh, Ying, I have a question. Um, what's the what's the cost of this, uh, for the overhead for, on, on machines that don't really suffer from memory pressure or aren't really doing swapping at all? Uh, is, there, is there a performance cost for, for, for this you if, if you're not using it? Uh, yes. Since, uh, since you're periodically we, uh, scanning? If, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, because sometimes uh, the promotion uh, uh, throughput can be high, and in, in our test, uh, if, if we do not do any restriction, just uh, uh, light the promotion, uh, allocate the pages uh, until the mini watermark. Uh, we, uh, I found sometimes there are even uh, there will be even 
memory allocation failure. Uh, okay. So uh, about the uh, uh, hot problem, uh, yeah, uh, when we scan the uh, page table that we process it, we will record the scan time uh, for each page. So later when the page is accessed, uh, we will uh, calculate uh, king page fault lengthy uh, we're subtracting the scan time from the access time. Uh, the lower the lengthy, the more possible the page is hot. So if, if the lengthy is less than uh, uh, the, the hot threshold, we will consider the page is hot and try to uh, promote, uh, promote it. So uh, to recall the uh, scan time, uh, we use the uh, neural balancing bits in struct page flags, uh, which is uh, previous used by the original neural balancing to, uh, uh, to 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 check whether a page is shared by multi socket. Uh, so uh, in this solution, uh, we 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 can uh, we can only uh, identify the hot pages in. PMAM and promote it to DRAM, but uh, uh, we will not uh, uh, reduce the cross socket uh, uh, access to PMAM directly. Uh, but uh, after we promote the, the uh, PMAM pages to DRAM, uh, we can still uh, reduce the uh, cross socket access to the to the DRAM pages. Uh, so to uh, how to determine the host threshold? Uh, yeah, we, we use uh, such a uh, algorithm. So, uh, for example, if we restrict uh, uh, to promote only 100 megabytes per second, uh, we will adjust the host threshold uh, automatically so that uh, uh, the total size of the hot pages identified within one second will be less than 100 megabytes. Uh, yeah, I have, the, the original. I, I have a question about the previous slide. Um, so the PMAM access, so this is specific to PMAM. And uh, PMM access uh -huh. is not um, uh, the PMM access type might not be uniform. Uh, writes can be much slower than reads, right? Uh, is there any consideration uh, to that? To the what kind of access it, it is to the PMM? Uh, yeah, the, you you mean the read write uh, different be between. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, for example, if page is uh, written, uh, it, uh, it's uh, more expensive to write to PMM, and it makes more sense to prioritize yeah, yeah. that page promotion com compared to reading. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, we, yeah, we're we considering about that to uh, the. The, the, the straightforward uh, solution is to use different uh, uh, host threshold for for read and write. Uh, for example, we use uh, a, a looser or, or larger uh, threshold for, for write. Uh, yeah, we can do that, uh, but uh, it, it needs some tuning. Uh, we, we have the basic idea, uh, but uh, we still have uh, more work. Uh, to do to to make it really uh, have the promise, yeah. Because the 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 read write can be identified by the we, we can identify if the page is read or write where the page falls. So we have all the information, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, we 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 may uh, 
work more on how to uh, how to how to do that. So the original uh, uh, neural balancing is for mapped pages only, uh, but for the uh, mapped file pages, uh, in fact, they are accessed via some uh, syscall. Uh, so we can hook the these syscalls uh, to re to recall the access time. Uh, so we can uh, then we can calculate the access lengthy where uh, subtracting the last access time from the current access time. Uh, the, this lengthy is comparable with the the uh, King page fault lengthy uh, we 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 uh, we we defined for the uh, mapped pages. So uh, we, we can share the same threshold adjustment and the rate limit uh, uh, code between the mapped and mapped pages. Uh, so now we have mm, the basic uh, demotion support and the promotion support. Uh, uh, they will they will uh, put the uh, try to put the hot pages in DRAM and code pages in PMAP. But uh, after some while, uh, it, it is possible that even the code DRAM page are as hot as the uh, hot PMAP pages then uh, all our promotion and demotion uh, can cannot uh, do something useful it's just uh, called thrashing between the DRAM and the PMAP so how to detect this uh, in, in theory it, it is possible for us to scan the page tables of all processes uh, to use uh, uh, to to clear the access the uh, clear and check the access bit uh, so we, we can scan multiple times uh, quickly to find out uh, the the access frequency of each pages and source them to to check whether the hot pages in DRAM and uh, code pages in PMAP. But uh, that is the overhead is high too. Another possibility is is that when we demote a page from DRAM to PMAP, uh, we can make the page inaccessible uh, as if the page is just. Uh, uh, scanned by the neural balancing uh, page table scanner. So when later when the page is accessed, we can calculate the uh, the the neural hint page fault lengthy for these demoted pages and check whether uh, it, it it is less than the hot threshold, so the page is considered hot. So uh, if the proportion of the uh, that the demot demoted pages are hot uh, to the all uh, demoted pages uh, is, is higher than some threshold. Uh, we we uh, we can uh, uh, we can detect that there are some thrashing uh, between the DRAM and PMAM, and uh, we can take some action, for example, to uh, uh, demote and uh, promote less or uh, make the hot threshold streaker so yeah it has better uh, identification uh, between the the code code page and hot pages uh, well, we also have uh, quite some to do for the promotion side uh, yeah uh, now we, we have since the the basic uh, promotion support patch side to the main list uh, for several variants. Uh, now I think the one of the uh, problem is that uh, uh, we still lack enough review uh, for these patches. So uh, I want to ask uh, here. I want to ask for your help uh, to review it if you have time and interest uh, for the for the patch side. Uh, 
uh, I will, we will send out the, the MF12 page promotion test site soon. And uh, uh, as, as uh, just asked by uh, David Horst, uh, the, the read write uh, uh, throughput, uh, read write performance of PMM is different. So uh, we may uh, uh, implement some kind of write bears uh, to. Uh, for that, uh, yeah, we, we, we have some idea and we are working on that. And Tim Chen uh, now is working on the C group based uh, uh, DRAM partition now. Uh, to play with it, uh, we have an experimental kernel uh, put on this reaper. It has the basic support and some other optimization. Uh, we, we we are testing now. Uh, the build and configuration uh, instruction can be found uh, in a readme file in the Reaper. Uh, we also do some evaluation uh, to our solution. Uh, use the two socket server machine with DRAM and PMAM. Uh, yeah, we test it with PM Bench and FIO. Uh, you can find that uh, with our solution, the uh, benchmark score can uh, increase uh, quite some. Uh, yeah, so the basic, uh, so so it works quite well, I think. Uh, yeah, we 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 have some detailed uh, detailed. Uh, test result. Uh, yeah, if you, you know, we we will run out of time. So if you have some, if you have interest, you can uh, take a look at the the, the, the slides by yourself. And uh, we also have some animation, but it cannot be shared. Show here. You can uh, find it uh, uh, in our uh, uh, in, in the uh, RPC website. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I almost ran out of time, so I, I will not go through the, the rest of the slides. So uh, do, do you have any question? Yeah, yeah. Dave was kind of hinting that you, you already did an evaluation of user space uh, solution. Uh, and do you have a pointer? about where we can find the details. How, how does it compare with, with Autonoma Falls? Yeah, I'll say, since I mentioned it, um, a lot of folks have tried this. We we actually had code to try these things. Um, I, I don't see any problem with us releasing that. We probably could. It just stunk. It didn't work very well, so we abandoned it. So if anybody wants to see our horrible, stinky code, I think we'd probably have no problem throwing it out somewhere. Maybe even yeah, as okay. a kind of test program, um, there are also folks that are um, that are looking at doing this a little more. I don't know. I'd say professionally. <laughs> so um, I, I'll, I will, uh, and that, that's inside of Intel right now. But I encourage, I'll encourage folks to. Yeah, one one of the thing I was getting to was the comparison, right? I mean, why did it suck, right? I mean, what because Numa Falls also is expensive because we are taking page faults, right? I mean, you know, so. Um, and then the 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 demotion actually makes sense when your DRAM is fully occupied, right? So you we ideally want to kind of detect. Uh, we would mostly end up in a scenario where DRAM is full, right? And we want to migrate hot. I got muted automatically. I'm not sure whether I you you are able to hear me. We can hear you, but unfortunately, we've got to the end of the session. So if you guys would like to um, um, keep on talking, you could arrange to meet in a hack room in the chat. But in the meantime, I think I'm going to go ahead and throw up Paul's slides. Uh, who's our next speaker? Quick here. Just going to give presenter to Paul right now, and uh, so we have our next talk here with with Paul and Matthew about cat proc fin maps. What could possibly go wrong?
and uh, you can start whenever you're ready. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go first to hand off to to uh, Matthew partway through here. Uh, you know, a lot of things uh, in a lot of uh, different deployments do a lot of uh, monitoring of uh, proc files, and uh, that's uh, wonderful. But there are some disadvantages. One thing that uh, we've seen at Facebook is we'll have a monitoring program that's uh, confined to a very tiny slice of the system. After all, the, the point of the system is to run this CPU bound application. All right, and so we have the idea is you, the monitoring thing gets what time it gets when it gets it, and it reads slash proc slash bit maps and hands back the information to the overall scripting that controls things and monitoring or Kubernetes or whatever you have, and life is good. Uh, the problem is that uh, this little monitoring script or program, or whatever it is, might be preempted holding a map sim. And that's going to block uh, address space changes in the CPU bound application. Uh, and uh, uh, in more detail, uh, so we've got this uh, monitoring application it requires MMAP SEM. It's going to read uh, proc PID as maps. And uh, it gets preempted. Or perhaps it runs out of, uh, out of CPU time in its uh, uh, container or whatever it's in. And then the CPU bound application has a thread that evokes MMAP. And that's going to block because it can't write acquire MAP sim. All right. Well, you know, that doesn't happen that often. Maybe it's not a problem. But uh, the same application, some other thread, takes a page fault. And that could be any thread. Now it's going to read acquire MAP sim. It doesn't need to write acquire it. But because we have fairness on MAP sim, it's going to block because there is an outstanding writer. Somebody's read holding. The read holder prevents the writer from acquiring the MAP sim. And now we can't reacquire it either. Um, and if other threads and other unrelated work consume all available CPU, uh, the monitoring application is not going to run very quickly. All right. And this means that uh, threads A and B are blocked for a long time. And definitely maybe a strong word, but for a long time. All right. Uh, and this happens occasionally across a large number of machines naturally, which, you know, we know we have a problem. But it's kind of nice to have something that doesn't require 100,000 machines for a couple of weeks to be able to test your fix. So uh, I put together a reproducer earlier this year. Um, and it's fairly simple. You have a process that maps a huge region and then maps and unmaps 4K chunks of it. Uh, and another one that uh, repeatedly scans proc PID maps and a bunch of other ones that do nothing but consume CPU. And uh, on my laptop, this will cause problems within a minute or so. Uh, and the URL at the bottom is uh, the GitHub address for it. Uh, this, you know, some people would argue this is abuse, and maybe they're right. On the other hand, it does reproduce the bug quickly and allows us to test fixes and, and uh, uh, also do debugging much more readily than we could otherwise. In addition, um, uh, like it or not, in my experience, if my software can stand up to some substantial abuse, uh, life is a lot easier for me. But I'll let you guys decide what you want to do with your software. Anyway, uh, if we run this, this is 24 runs. This is on 5.4, which is what happened to be on my laptop. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the MMAP, unmap latency gets really, really bad really, really quickly with a fairly small number of busy tasks. This is on a, on a 16 CPU system, all right? Uh, and uh, when we have 1,000 of them, uh, most of them hang. And hang is, again, kind of a strong word. That just means that they were stuck when the test ended. Uh, presumably, we've got a completely fair scheduler. Eventually, they would run. But yeah, as you can see, 12 seconds, they haven't. So uh, as far as most applications are concerned, 12 seconds being stuck is equivalent to a hang. Anyway, so I hope I've convinced you there is a problem. Uh, it does happen. We've seen it. And, and I've demonstrated we can reproduce it readily. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to hand it over to Willie to talk about a potential solution. Thanks, Paul. Um, so as uh, Liam is going to talk about in the next session, uh, he and I have been working on, mostly he, to be fair, have been working on a new data structure to store the uh, VMAs in. Uh, right now, they are stored in a red-black tree, and the Red black tree is protected by the MMAP SEM. Um, the, the MMAP SEM protects 
a lot of stuff, uh, really, really a lot of stuff. And so part of part of what we're trying to do is split the stuff protected by the MAPSAM into uh, being protected by other locks. And um, Liam's going to go into a lot more detail later about exactly how we do that. But the upshot for this talk is that the VMA tree is protected with a spin lock um, for, mod for, for writers. Um, but on the read side, we can use RCU. And as Paul can tell you, RCU solves all problems. It creates a few new ones, but it does solve all contention problems because there is absolutely nothing to contend on. Um, so one of the things we need to do in order to make that work is to free VMAs um, through RCU. That's fine. Uh, Paul put in some fantastic infrastructure to, to do that. That's That all works. That's not a problem. Um, it does allow some new well, not new. It allows inconsistencies to appear in uh, reading um, the, the, the VMA tree. Um, so are they acceptable? Um, my, my answer is yes, um, obviously, otherwise we, we, would have, we would have gone a different route with this. But I think, I think it's worth talking about what kind of inconsistencies we currently see and which ones we're going to see. So it, it has always been possible to see um, to, to, to see a, a tree, to, to see a list of VMAs uh, by, by looking at prop pit maps, which are not entirely consistent with each other. Um, first of all, the, 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 there's no lock being held. So if, 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 you, if you take it, or well, even with the lock being held, you're not holding a lock in user space. So by the time you get back from calling prop pit maps, it may have changed. So that's just stale, right? That, that, that happens all the time. Uh, the, the second thing is that maybe you didn't allocate a large enough buffer in user space in order to um, store all of the, 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 the textual representation of all of the VMAs. And in that situation, we will take the MMAPSAM, we will read the first chunk, we drop the MMAPSAM, return to user space, user space says, oh, I haven't got it at all, uh, calls, calls read again, grabs the MMAPSAM again. Now, of course, between the dropping the MMAPSAM and acquiring the MMAPSAM, the VMA tree may, may have changed. You may have called MMAP or MMAP or something else. And um, so you may see an inconsistency if you have to do multiple reads. That already happens. So applications should already be prepared to cope with the possibility that the VMA tree that it sees, that the, the list of VMAs it sees is not entirely accurate. Um, if they're not, well, uh, bad news, because that, that's about to get a whole lot worse. Now that we're holding no lock at all, uh, well, we're using the RCU lock, so we know that nothing's going to go away underneath us. Um, we may see, for example, um, uh, 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 we, we, we may see if two VMAs are created, we may see the second one being created, not the first one being created, even though we know that the first one was created first. Oh, well. Uh, if, we, um, if we call M unmap in the middle and then create a uh, 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 and call MMAP, we might see two VMAs which overlap. That might be something that you end up seeing. Um, for a monitoring application, this clearly doesn't matter. Um, if it's for some other application, well, you know, it could have seen that if, if the read had stopped halfway. So I'm asserting that the new inconsistencies that can be seen or will be seen more frequently are not new um, but you know we you know reality may intervene and and, and we may have to um, we, we, we may have to do that we may have to make some changes so uh, actually I, I, I should take this question um, oh well Paul's answer to on, on, on the chat already so I will. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the, at, the, at, the, at that point, we've already um, output some of the information. So we can't, you know, we, 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 we can't produce, we, 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 we can never actually say this is definitely it. We can make some assertions. We, we, we know that the iteration will eventually terminate. Um, we're, we're, not going to, we're not going to jump back to the beginning and start re-showing things we've already shown. We are going to 
go through the address space in order. And if the application detects, oh, hey, there was, there was some change in the middle and this is, you know, I, I have a, a state that can never have occurred, it can go back and, and reread it. That, that would be something else that the, uh, the, the, the user space could choose to do. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Jan. Uh, we will generally go with slightly inconsistent outputs, and if some application is broken by it, we'll have to come up with something better. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't break user space, and we'll, we'll do our best not to. So we did some performance runs. Um, it, this, this, this was a prototype from eight months ago. Um, things have improved since. We weren't able to get um, a large number of busy runs. There were some bugs in the tree at the time. They've probably been fixed by now, but we haven't had time to rerun the tests and re redo the, uh, the data. Um, as you can see, we pretty much have linear scalability on the maple tree. Um, the, the, the median number is bouncing around a little bit, but it's all within you know, normal sorts of tolerances. Um, the minimum latency is way higher. Yeah, uh, so uh, don't read too much into the precise numbers that we're seeing here. Um, we, we've, we've done some uh, fantastic optimize. Well, we, I mean, Liam, frankly, has done some fantastic optimization since, and he's really been driving down the cost of the maple tree. Um, it, it's, it, and I mean, the, the, this test did show one of the things we got out of this test was, oh, look, that minimum number is way too high. Like it used to be, at, you know, 10% of what it was. Um, but yeah, the, the scalability is what we were aiming for here. And, you know, as, as you might expect, using RCU means you have essentially flat scalability. Um, the data structure is also more cache efficient. So uh, we have, um, we, we have much better sharing between CPUs on a cache line basis uh, than the red black tree did, because the red black tree will tend to invalidate uh, cache lines across all CPUs um, as, as it adds and deletes things. Um, the maple tree will do that much less frequently. But obviously, this is not ready to merge. Uh, one one of the problems is, I mean, obviously, the uh, the maple tree itself needs to be in a, in a fit state to merge, and it certainly wasn't back in January. Um, I think getting pretty close now. But um, the, the, the it, it's not just propid maps which is uh, covered by this. And in fact, the uh, I, I believe the Facebook monitoring script does not in fact use propid maps. Propid maps is, is is easy. It actually uses s maps uh, because um, it it wants to know exactly how much memory is resident. It just it doesn't want to just know how much is mapped. It wants to know how much is resident in each process because that's the function it's doing. It's, it's trying to figure out how much memory is each process taking up. And so it doesn't use proper maps, it uses proper S maps. And the tricky part uh, with uh, S maps is that it walks the page tables. It doesn't just walk the VMA tree, it also walks the page tables. And in order to um, walk page tables in RCU mode, we need to RCU free the page tables as well. Now, we already RCU free page tables under some circumstances. Um, some architectures require it, uh, but x86 doesn't. Um, and x86 will require it under some circumstances. Um, I think with certain hypervisors, it, it, it does it. I haven't looked at this in a little bit. Um, I, I, I looked at, you know, what, what's it going to take? And I, I saw this huge mess around, oh, we will ask you free page tables sometimes, but not others. And so I think there must be a performance hit to always freeing page tables under RCU, but I don't actually know. I mean, I, I'm just assuming that someone's gone to the trouble of putting in two different ways of doing things. So there must be a reason to do it both ways some of the time. Um, so I think what I'm really asking for is, does anyone know um, 
regular page labels and um, what the performance penalty will be for um, what, the, what the performance problem will be if, if we just always ask you pretty page tables. Anyway, this is, this is basically all the talk we have because kind of hoping for discussion, debate, people saying, oh my God, we need this right now. I mean, is it is it just Facebook who cares about this? I will say that MF and scalability is a big problem in a bunch of workloads that we've tried over the years. So it's really cool to see progress here. Um, so I think there's a lot of people who would get benefit out of this. Um, I think people today just kind of avoid it in general. Like they simply will, you know, like not do MF as much or do it in bigger chunks to avoid this. So it'd be, it'd be nicer not, not to have to people have people like work around it in lots of ways. So I think it's really cool to do. And as for RCU freeing up page tables in XD6, um, I turned it on unconditionally once nothing fell over so um we can we can at least explore going to do it more widely i don't think it's a big problem whatever it is power power pc has done it for a long time and they have fairly big machines so um hopefully uh on the other hand they have much more restricted workloads so i guess the the potential problem would be is if there's some strange workload that hits x86 but not power pc that cares I, I have my doubts given the large size of power PC machines, but it's the kind of thing, Matthew, we could also just go turn on and do some big zero day runs and see what changes and see if anybody would notice in there. So I have I, I have no fundamental objection to just trying it. Well, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Thank you. One potential concern I have about as you freeing page tables is with the um, um, the accounting, as uh, w like how do we account with page tables that have been uh, freed but not really yet. That is, we've we've called free, but the but RCU hasn't run yet. Yes. Increasingly, this was answered by PowerPC. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you're talking about like the per mm page table counters that we have, right? We take that into account when we're ooing, for instance. And you're saying if we RCU free them, then there's a gap between when we decrement those counters in the mm and when the memory actually becomes available to somebody else. Yes. Is that the concern? Yes. I think it's a problem, but I think it's a generic RCU problem. So I don't think it's really specific to this. It's like anything that you RCU free, like is not available as a page immediately. So I don't know, maybe Paul can talk about that. Do we do anything on the page allocator to make sure that that things happen faster to get freed? I don't know. Oh, the, there are, there's a bunch of forward progress stuff in the RCU grace period thing. There needs to be more. Um, but that would be one concern is that uh, if we're RCU, if we have something that's just churning page tables like crazy, uh, we're RCU freeing them. That means more latency while it's being free, and so potentially there could be a uh, an issue. But but again, uh, we have architectures that do it and haven't had a problem. So you know, um, it would be really great to try it. I really like your idea, Dave, of of giving it a try. Or did I miss the or did I miss the point of the question? I was typing while you're starting it before I realized it was no, for me. <laughs> I think you covered it, Paul. <laughs> okay.
Don't all talk at once now. I guess uh, one thing it might be worth uh, bringing out if people aren't looking at the chat is uh, uh, an issue that Alexander Graf mentioned, uh, which is shouldn't a process be able to be guaranteed to see its own uh, stuff consistently? Um, my personal opinion is, uh, as uh, Matthew said earlier, uh, that's not guaranteed right now. I mean, if you do two reads, you drop the MAP stem in between times, you see inconsistencies. Um, for it to get that, I, I think it really needs to expect that it has to shut down other maps and unmaps if it wants to see something consistent. But um, that's my opinion, and I don't claim to be a, an MM guy. I think all you said that works now. Awesome. Um, <laughs> OK, we can move this discussion over here then. Um, so you're basically saying the um, like th there is no issue as long as that process doesn't do in any of its that doesn't do any map or MUN map, um, which I, I concur with. Um, I don't know if anybody out there is expecting it. So the only uh, occasion that I remember where um, a process was was violently and and uh, like super adamantly uh, introspecting um, maps, and it wasn't ASMAPs, it was religiously maps. Um, what was was the Java one time? Uh, I, I don't I don't know why. Like really, I, I haven't dug into the code on on why exactly you would do that. Um, I only implemented the conversion routines in QMU to make sure that it actually could do that even in user space simulation. But um, it wouldn't run without looking at its own maps through the eyes of of proc self maps. Um, I don't know if it does that under a uh, an MM lock internally, where it just says um, I, I cannot do any M maps. Meanwhile. Um, this is a user space ABI, right? Like, did we do any guarantees? Did we provide any guarantees that we would be breaking with this? So that's, I think, the main concern. Is it possible uh, to, oh. to do something like run a test with some, some of those Java applications with, uh, with a prototype of this code and see what happens? I think it makes much more sense to, to just grab a Java expert and, and um, like look at the code and see what it does. OK. Yeah, it works for me. Just, Assert, assert whether this is um, sensible or not. I mean, for debugging, you could also just output junk. I mean, we could, as a debugging option, just output junk in there that we think is possible that this would generate and then see what breaks. We could make it, you know, as worse as we think it will, as bad as we think it will happen and then, you know, turn it up a little fast there and see what, see what breaks. Yeah, good idea. Chaos monkey mode. Yeah, and Alex, uh, the other Alexander uh, says that uh, PropPit SMAPs is often read in 4K chunks um, and that it often splits things up as a result or does multiple reads as a result. I don't know if that applies to Java, but that'd be another good question to ask the Java experts. Are, are, you, are you willing to do that, Alex, Alexander Graf? Ask him. To, to ask a Java expert? I, I, can, I can try to find some internally, yeah. I think I think there's an, uh, a limit inside the kernel right now, and it will yield uh, the lock return to user space and how to be recalled again. So it is possible that uh, if your map is big enough, you're going to get multiple locks and unlocks, and thus a possible inconsistency today. True. True. Okay. I'll, I'll just ask either it's a bug in, in, in Java anyways already then. Um, and, and I think I have seen that behavior before where we ran across the 4K boundary um, and then had to, had to like improvise. Um, yeah, I'll ask. Thank you. Thank you. That, that'd be really helpful. So if you think about how it works right now, and uh, it, it'll be kind of a bit different, uh, like Willie said. Uh, it, Basically, when it reads, it will read up to the to the boundary and return what it's found, and then continue from the address where it's stopped. Uh, so when it continues from the address where it's stopped, you could potentially hit, uh, today, you could potentially hit something that doesn't make sense to the end of the previous entry. Um, what this change would potentially do uh, is basically the same thing, actually. Because we would take the RCU read lock and get the 4K chunk and then return it. 
uh, so there could potentially be an inconsistency in the next call. So your snapshot will be split. If, if you think of it as, as windows into what the system has, uh, you'll either get uh, one segment that, it, that is consistent and then the next segment that isn't, or, um, or you'll get a full consistent uh, uh, snapshot. Does that make sense? Well, if, if what you're saying is, is accurate, then the, the RCU changes wouldn't change anything, right? It's yeah, I don't think they will. I think, no, yeah, no, I don't think they, they, they would. Right? They, they think about it, yeah. right? If, if, think about it from the maple tree point of view. You, you've got, you know, you, 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 you grab a node, a leaf node out of the tree, and you read out of that leaf node. But somebody else grabs a spin log, comes in, changes what's in that leaf node while you're reading from it. Right. If you're in that leaf node, then that leaf node will be RCU freed, right? Yeah, right. Right, so that leaf node is fine. So the only, yeah, if, if, if there is a, a large, if there's a large churn of data, then it, uh, it might be possible that, yeah, there might be something. If you have an RCU read lock though, Yeah, I think there there might be. There, you're right. There could be inconsistencies across across chunks within the chunk itself. Yeah. So you, you're going to keep making progress because you're you're going to keep iterating. You're going to keep going next, right? So at, at any point, even if you have to hit a restart point and go up to the top, you'll you'll be continuing from point from the end of the VMA that you just started from, but you might end up in the middle of a new VMA. So you might see two VMAs which overlap each other slightly. Right, so I guess the only worry is if the application is assuming the entire return is consistent and then just checking uh, the intermittent uh, portion versus you would then have to scan through to make sure that there's no VMAs that don't um, have some weird overlapping. Uh, there's also probably no way to know that there was a gap missed. Right. It's kind of a interesting question. I mean, uh, in some sense, outputting overlapping stuff gives the application receiving the data a very clear indication that it's inconsistent. Uh, the other approach would be to uh, to to try to adjust. You know, say, okay, I last I, I last thing I output in it here, so uh, there's the thing that started here. I'm going to cheat and say that it was shorter and started later. Uh, I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> My guess is that uh, letting them know that it changed by having the overlap is probably friendlier. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that something's going in like this um, uh, to, to get this information. It's a common thing, it seems. Uh, Dave Hansen uh, notes something on the chat that's really important, and, and that is that it might be good for us to, to uh, document everything that can happen now and what can happen uh, in the future with the RC reads, and I, and I think that's an excellent point. I, th I think it might be better to document this as uh, things we guarantee, and that is if a VMA was present before you started the read and remains present until the until after the read is finished, we definitely show it. Yeah. If it but, uh, I... start if, if it disappeared in the meantime or appeared in the meantime, um, you might see it or not. Go ahead, Liam. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, yep. At, at the current time, though, like if, if you use this file and then use the information in this file to do a map yourself, there's no guarantee that someone hasn't come in and, and, and done something to the map in between those two times, right? There's no guarantee. Uh, there's other uses for it, though. Uh, one use is, for example, to look and see uh, how, how many huge pages you have. Uh, another use is to just see how much memory is being consumed, right? Um, you know, so there's, and there's a lot of different uses for it. I, that's just, a, I'll just throw out those two because I remember them and I don't want to, and we're at the end of time anyway, so we should probably right. be respectful of other people's times. Uh, thank you all very much for the for the feedback and the suggestions and, and especially for the offers of help uh, and uh, should be exciting. Yeah, thank you.
All right, thanks very much for the talk and all the discussion. We're going to go on a break now for um, 15 minutes and we'll be back with Leon's talk on maple tree. All right, I'm, I'm making you uh, a presenter, really. Thanks. No problem. Uh, Liam's been suffering through flaky internet recently, so uh, that may be what has happened. Okay, so the maple tree. Um, uh, Liam and I have been working on this project together uh, for a couple of years now. Um, the division of labor is mostly that uh, I came up with the initial idea and uh, Liam's done all the work. Um, and, and somehow he still thinks it's worth putting my name on the sides, which I'm quite grateful for. Uh, we, we, we do talk about it all the time, a little facetious. So what is the maple tree? Um, it, it, it was kind of invented um, uh, in a fairly ad hoc manner, and then it became apparent that what I'd really done was, was, was reinvent a bee tree. Uh, so now we're just calling it a, an RCU-safe, range-optimized bee tree variant. Um, if, if you look at the classical literature on this stuff, you'll see there's, there's some things we don't do. Um, a lot of the literature assumes that you're storing um, single values, and uh, so it, it, it's optimized for that. Uh, we our, our primary target has been the VMA tree, so we naturally want to store things which have a range. Uh, so something that starts at a particular address and then continues for a certain number of pages. Um, we are optimized for uh, dense, so uh, VMAs which are adjacent to each other. Um, some of the address-based randomization stuff will uh, try to spread the VMAs throughout the address space, um, and that's not great for a tree, it, it's, it's not the end of the world, but it, it's not the, uh, the the perfect solution. So how we've done that is that uh, we encode these things as um, start followed by pointer. And so the length is implicit in, because the, the next start minus the start of this one is, is, is the length. Uh, so instead of storing a, a start length pointer um, treble, we, we store a, a duo um, to start and pointer, which means that if you have uh, a, a, a gap, the pointer is null. Um, and so we've got an illustration on, on this um, diagram here that you can see on um, on the side um, showing a, a one leaf one leaf node and, and then a few parent nodes. Uh, compared to standard B trees, uh, we have quite small nodes. Um, We've done that for a number of reasons. Uh, most uh, the classical B tree is to uh, handle storage, and so you you want to read in from disk, you know, four kilobytes or two hundred and fifty six kilobytes at once. Uh, but we're we're dealing with with memory, and so we have, are dealing with CPU caches, and so we think a smaller node is is better for us. Uh, that's an assumption which is going to be tested. We actually started out with 128 byte nodes and decided that was just too small. Uh, we end, And so we ended up going to uh, 256 byte nodes. We also have the ability to search the tree looking for a gap that is at least a particular size. Uh, and again, this is for the VMA tree, so that's why we added this feature. Um, when you call mmap, you are saying, please find me a gap that is at least this big, uh, somewhere that I can put this this M map, and so to avoid scanning every single node in the tree, we cache at uh, each node. We, we we cache the size of the largest gap in any node uh, below that one. Um, so you, you you can see um, we've got um, we've got thirty stored in this one, and you see. That node has 25 in it, that one has 30. And then we could go down again, and you can see that uh, this one has, uh, he's, he's, he's stopped putting, he's putting it in. But yeah, the, the, the size of the largest gap anywhere in this tree is, is, is 30. Uh, yeah, 
Uh, obviously, the primary thing you do in a, in, in a VMA tree is you look up a VMA by address. So that's obviously what, it, what it's um, optimized for. Uh, one, of, one of the pieces of functionality we added is bulk loading. Um, things that, again, don't really come up in the literature is um, when you're store, if, if you do an N map, which covers, so you do an M map map fixed, which covers a large range, or you do an M unmap of a large range, you end up having to um, bulk delete a lot of um, a, lo a lot of entries, and that causes us a certain amount of pain. I don't know. I, it's something that doesn't happen terribly often. Um, obviously, there's 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 the bulk delete of um, when 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 the process exits, you you actually want to delete everything from the tree, um, but uh, it's relatively rare. But it does happen that applications can call m unmap of a lot of VMAs all at once. Um, very much depends on the application. So locking, we talked about this in the last session, but in, for those who who weren't in it. Um, we have we, we protect with a spin lock um the patches that you'll see today do not move anything out from underneath the mmap sem uh the mmap sem is still there and uh so we're actually just adding the spin lock um so readers will continue to take the mmap lock and um It will be in follow-up patches where we start to actually move things out from underneath the uh, the the, the mmap sem. Um, the the object here is to just it's, the object for the first set of patches is to get the uh, maple tree in as a because the maple tree is an independent data structure, right? It's not just going to be used for uh, VMA trees. It's going to be used for a whole bunch of things in future. I have all kinds of plans for it, but I don't want to talk about it in this session because we don't have time for it. Um, but the, the maple tree is an independent storage data structure, and then someone should put that in and convert the VMA tree to use it as the first user. So um, we are looking to show performance wins um, simply from replacing the data structure, and then we we will optimize the locking in follow-on patches um, yeah and we are also going to have our own we're going to have new iterators for vma so uh, much less of this uh, calling vma next and following v chains of vma pointers we're actually going to we, we actually treat the tree as the as a grown-up data structure and and we uh, iterate over the contents of the tree um, using uh, a, a maple tree iterator. Uh, so, uh, okay, I, 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 I mis misremembered uh, VM slides. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so VM wants to talk next about what the RCE future looks like. Um, so once we're moving stuff out from inside the um, the, 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 the MMAP SAM, how do we how do we make this work? How do we take advantage of this? Um, so for readers, um, we so so one of the one of the primary things that we have to care about is the um, is is page faults, right? Um, I I think everyone has probably felt the pain of dealing with page faults. Um, it's not. Not just Facebook with the uh, um, uh, with 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 with, with the, uh, monitoring workload, um, having every page fault take the uh, MMAP sem. Um, I mean that that's that's contention on the cache line, right? And we really do have applications with thousands of threads, each running simultaneously on CPUs, all taking page faults at the same time. This is a real problem. Um, even even on my laptop, right? I mean, I've I've I've, I've got Firefox running right now. Um, it is presumably taking a lot of page faults. Um, I'm, I'm not monitoring it at the moment, but it, I have in the past, and it takes a lot of page faults and a lot of threads all at the same time. Um, 
So we have a prototype where we will um, simply take the RC read lock in order to take a, a page fault. Um, if it's a minor page fault, that is enough. Um, if it is not, if, if, if we need to actually allocate memory, uh, and particularly if we need to do IO, or we need to call into a file system or a device driver, um, we are adding a reference count to the VMA. Um, and that allows the file system, so we, 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 we take a ref count, so this is a slow path, right? The, the first path we really dealt with, if, if there was a page that can be added, that all happens onto the RCU lock and that's fine. Um, if we need to uh, sleep, we take a ref count on the VMA and we drop the RCU log. And then we call into the file system or device driver, whatever, and it maybe does IO, maybe it allocates its memory by sleeping, it doesn't matter. The protection that it was guaranteed before by having the MMAP sent held is that the VMA was not going to go away underneath it and we've got a ref count on the VMA, so it can't go away underneath it. And um, that it could sleep, right? If, if you're holding the RCU read lock, you can't sleep. So we drop the RCU read lock before we call into the device drivers. So from the device driver point of view, or the file system point of view, nothing changes. Liam, you're back. Hello, can you hear me? I, I hate your ISP so much. <laughs> Uh, Dave Foothill says he can't hear me. Okay. Has, has this been silent for everyone the whole time? <laughs> we could hear you. Oh, okay. great. I could hear myself, and that's it. So that was, that was awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I, I lost internet. So I, I, I've been doing my best to run your slides for you. Um, do, do you. Do we just keep going, or do, you, or do you want to start talking at this slide? And uh, No, go ahead me. and finish this one. I'll take over the next one if you... Okay, that, that works for me, sure. Um, okay, so that's how uh, page fault is going to get handled. Um, from the uh, writer point of view, we are going to need to, um, well, one, if, 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 if we're deleting a VMA and there's a ref count held on it, we need to sleep waiting for that ref count to be decreased. Um, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not quite a plain ref count. Um, it, 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 you know, we, we, we need to also sleep on it. That's gonna be a fairly rare operation, right? Uh, ap applications do not generally unmap the VMA being used by one thread uh, from another thread, um, that, that that tends to lead to SIG faults. I mean, it does happen. There are some strange applications out there that, that do this and then handle the SIG fault and blah, blah, so blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Actually, actually, there is a little of wrinkle there because uh, of the way we, like the application may have two different areas that have been merged by the kernel as one VMA. And so, yes, the application will not unwrap the space where it is faulting, but it might be unmapping a, an adjacent space that has been merged into the same VM by, by the kernel. Yeah, that is possible. Um, I think also there's a possibility of uh, other threads looking at it if it's a shared VMA, but uh, those, those are pretty rare things that, that yeah, you'll have to, to work around. Uh, the merging, you would basically be faulting something while someone else is mapping and then they have to be uh, connected either by start and end or in and start uh, to be merged. Uh, those are definitely corner cases that would need to be looked at. Thanks. Uh, yeah, but I, I do want to remind you that we only actually take the VMA ref count in the slow path. So both the reader has to hit the slow path and the writer has to unmap it at the same time while it's presumably blocked on I.O. or something. So, I, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, that there are times that this is going to happen, uh, but it's, I, I, I still think it's going to be fairly rare for it to happen. <clears throat> uh, what, what else did you want to say here about forking? I, I, I don't think I fully understood that. 
Yeah, so uh, the RCU feature, basically, uh, right now the way the forking happens is we lock the old MM and the new MM, and we copy over information back and forth and duplicate the VMAs, um, and then we unlock it. Uh, in the future, what we're thinking is uh, we could lock the old tree, duplicate the tree, and then unlock the old tree, and the old tree can, it doesn't, it will never be used again. Um, and, then, and then just use the new copy to iterate through the VMAs, uh, copying them. So basically, you increment the ref count through all of them, and then you decrement as you go through and make your own copies. Or you delete it from the tree if the VMA don't copy flag is set. That was kind of the part I was thinking of there. I, I guess I have to do the next slide thing for you now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, performance. Um, so I, I did want to put in one slide on performance because uh, David Lord did put in that this was about the performance. Um, so basically, the, the only thing I really want to say is right now the real work real world workloads are pretty much not changed. The user time goes down, the system time goes up. And the worst ki case in the elapsed time on the kernel build is is less than a second. Um, so we're getting on par performance is what I would say for real world uh, workloads. The uh, uh, the uh, the the other thing is is basically we we need. It would be good to identify benchmarks. I think this came up in the in previous topics. So benchmarks in which we can say, okay, these are the ones to use. I think it was Michelle's actually. Come to think of it, um, these are the benchmarks we want to target for this particular um, change, and or these this particular MM area change, or even the entire MM stuff. Uh, basically, what I've been doing is running through the uh, MM tests uh, sweep on on before and after to see if I can identify anywhere. Um, the, the, uh, the big win, I think, in performance-wise is, uh, uh, besides RCU and the locking, um, the locking uh, portion is that right now, the way that the tree, because it's an RB tree, you can't just uh, change one part of the tree, right? Um, you have to remove. And then re-add. And if you think about that operation, if you're removing a node from an RB tree, so all the colors change and things get shifted around. And then you add it back. And so everything kind of like just gets reverted almost exactly the way it was, except maybe now there's a different uh, interval in between the next or the previous or something. So what, what I would like to see is is to reduce uh, the modifications to trees. So we don't need to say, oh, we're, we're removing this piece, so we're going to delete it, and then we're going to re-add it. Uh, what we can just do is just write over it and know that we're writing over something, so we get the VMA to free, and then we store the new VMA and, and that sort of thing. So there's ways to, to benefit uh, uh, beyond just the, uh, the locking, even though the locking will most likely be way, <laughs> way bigger in the performance wise. Uh, so yeah, uh, and, and there are trade-offs as well with this tree. The updates can be more work. Uh, if, if you're writing a larger, a large area overwriting multiple VMAs or something, it can, it can be a lot of work. Uh, the only thing that I've seen that does multiple VMAs is Android, and I think Android does two and I think it's the guard VMA. It has a VMA on, on one side. I'm not sure on that. Uh, either that or it's because they use CLang, uh, and, and CLang does something uh, special. I, I'm not sure if that's actually built into CLang, even. Um, so yeah, they, but sometimes, like I said, the writes can be even less because we don't need to take things out of the tree and that. Uh, but the reads do seem to be faster. Uh, which is the majority of what the VMA's tree is used for anyways. Uh, can we go to the, the next slide? Yep. Really? 
Oh. You still have control. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, so there's other potential users uh, for the tree. Oh, maybe I have control now. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's other potential users. So there's other potential users, uh, the IDA and the IDR. Uh, to get there, uh, the tree will need to change a bit. Uh, we have uh, we have to start using dense nodes. Dense nodes is a concept uh, to increase the efficiency of one, of uh, ranges of length one. Um, most of the multi-node type stuff is already in the tree. Uh, it's just uh, not as well tested. Or well, maybe there's test cases, but there's not users, so it could potentially uh, have fallen to the wayside. Uh, no, there's test cases, but the nodes have been disabled actually. So we need to re re-enable that and and sort of figure all that stuff out and make sure it's working well. Um, so that's um, and and then the other user uh, that comes to mind is the page cache. Um, uh, earlier on, I hope. Willie mentioned that we do support searching for gaps, so we would replace the gaps for uh, uh, for search marks, uh, and then you could mark uh, where to search in the tree, uh, and and also for shadow entries for pruning the shadow entries. Um, yeah, so that's. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, -ho. all right. Well, <laughs> thanks everyone for being uh, for being here, um, and I like to ask, open it up for any questions. So, so as is, um, without thinking of any, any of the performance benefits that having an uh, enabling RCU in the future will bring, um, you're, at this point we have, you, you have a drop-in replacement for the, the RB tree, for the, the VMA tree. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, there is no, you're, there's no ad, more added complexity from what the RB tree was doing to what the the, the maple tree is going to do, right? For example, um, right now we, we have three data structures, um, basically to like compensate for some of the the, the shortcomings of our B trees, thinking complexity wise, right? So by having a shallow tree, um, we can immediately like get rid of the list, which you've done. We can get rid of the, the cache, which you've done, and uh, basically have one data structure to govern uh, VMAs. I, I find that yes. really, really appealing, not even thinking about performance-wise. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're basic, we're, we're basically, the worst case scenario is nothing really changes, right? Yeah, so, so the only wise. thing, yeah, performance-wise, nothing, nothing really changes except for maybe, uh, was it the one? There was one benchmark that was not as great, um, uh, but but the the only the added complexity comes with the locking right now because it's um, in the future the way that we want to lock is is reversed, right? We don't we want to we don't want to have the MAPSM guarding everything. We want to have uh, the maple tree lock guarding the edits to the tree. Uh, so once we uh, change because we we have an RCU data structure uh, to edit that data structure you have to take the spin lock or take an RCU read lock and you can't sleep in those so be, so the because of the way the ordering is when you're going through and you need to say oh, I don't know allocate something um, it was not a problem before but now that's a potential sleep path so uh, Lockdep will, will yell at you, or RCU uh, checks will, will yell at you. So I had to put in a lot of these lock on locks, um, which is really, uh, really unfortunate. Uh, and and that's kind of probably one of the things people looking through the code will notice and will say, what is what is going on here? And and that's basically why is because this is RCU, and and we have to be. Uh, technically correct even though we know that no one will change it under us because right now it's protected by the uh, by the uh, MAP lock globally I, I forget what were the the problems with using sleep of bar you oh, I don't remember <laughs> 
Peter really wanted to do that. Uh, oh, um, I can uh, reply on this. Uh, so simple RCU, the read side is a little bit slower than a classical RCU or other flavors of RCU. However, uh, for uh, the tracer requirements and EBPF, uh, Paul McKinney did a RCU tasks trace, which allows taking page fault and sleeping within the read side lock as well. So, so it's similar to SRCU, but without all the overhead of the read side. So, so maybe there are common use cases there to look into. I really want to avoid adding trace uh, that all fixes it. Sorry, but you cut out there. Can you repeat that, Peter? I want to see task trace RCU usage until Paul fixes it. Oh, yeah, of course. I discussed with Paul the no arts uh, requirement yesterday, and he's going to put that on his uh, to-do list, on his backlog. But anyway, I think their problem with SRCU was that there was a lot of gate thread activity for call SRCU. Well, that's one, maybe one thing, but the other one is the, 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 the memory barrier that you have uh, on the read side lock of SRCU, which is slower, so it might matter here for performance. Yeah, that, that, that wasn't their concern at the time. Okay. It, it, it might be like, it might reduce complexity for, for the sake of a barrier. I don't see that to be too, too bad. Yeah, and I guess the, the other thing about it is we need to figure out what needs to change for VMA locking uh, uh, as well and try and do it all, uh, well, try and do it um, so that we don't, we don't step on each other or we don't, we don't change too much in the area at once uh, because Michelle is also working on, on the S, uh, SPF stuff, right? So. Uh, Ideally, we would have the SPF come in as well as as the maple tree to just make things much quicker. So, so I actually have comments on that regarding the the, the page fold pass and the the thing we, we were discussing, like if there's a page fold that takes a reference and we wait for that. I'm, I really feel that. I'm not super comfortable with that, and I don't have a full solution for it either. But I, I think it would be really nice if we had a way to completely sidestep that issue by uh, being able to do some speculative page roll. That is, we would uh, not do anything that prevents a writer from occurring, and then at commit time have a precise check to know if there was an interfering writer or not. And uh, if if we could get something figured out that does that, I think it would be a lot better than still having edge cases where where we have uh, read or write or interference when they work on things that are not actually the same part of the address space. So I did get a, a boff at it, uh, so we can discuss the locking uh, for tomorrow. Yes, because we're probably going to run out of time. Uh, how much time do we have? Because I, I, I can take this if... Uh... Yeah, we're actually at the end of the session, so the okay. box sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Yep, thanks, right. guys, for... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Okay, our next talk is from Pasha. This is about uh, preserving state for fast hypervisor update. I'm just going to hand present it over to him right now and get his slides up. Everything should be ready, so you can start whenever you want, Pasha. Okay, just uh, let me see. Okay, now I can change the slides. Okay, so um, in this talk, uh, I'd like uh, to give an introduction and uh, a, a way to do fast hypervisor update uh, with the mainline Linux and uh, uh, available VMMs. 
and uh, also I'd like to discuss about uh, the way to preserve the state uh, across the Libut. So during the hypervisor update, we have to preserve state of the running virtual machines, devices, and uh, 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 some other related data structures. And um, there is no convenient way to do that currently, but uh, I'll show the way it is uh, done, like at least one of the way how it can be done now and uh, why it's not uh, ideal. So uh, this is outline. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what is uh, what is fast hypervisor update, why it's needed uh, compared to alternatives. Uh, then I'll show uh, a small demo. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit. I'll, I'll show some uh, data using QMU uh, VMM. And then uh, the discussion topics are going to be how to, uh, what is currently used and how that can be improved. And for the future improvement, uh, I'll also uh, briefly talk about the multi root update. So, so uh, the hypervisor update uh, is important because um, cloud relies on uh, virtualization and um, cloud being a shared environment, uh, we cannot really shut down the VMs uh, to do the regular uh, reboot and uh, like the traditional update of a server. We have to uh, have the downtime for the VMs as short as possible and uh, ideally the VMs should uh, keep, uh, like sh should resume uh, after the update from where they were uh, post. So sh uh, shutting down the VMs is not an option. And uh, of course, th the reasons for updates are uh, well known. It's a uh, security functionality, performance, stability. All of those are important for the availability promise which cloud vendors are giving. So the there are two alternatives which uh, provide uh, a way to do a fast hypervisor update and uh, I'll talk briefly about these alternatives. One of them is hot patching. So hot patching is uh, a very good uh, method to fix uh, uh, a zero day security issue, but uh, it's not uh, an update strategy. You cannot really update to a new version of kernel using hot patching and uh, hot patching also adds uh, a lot of uh, other complexities and limitations which uh, I listed here. So, and another one is live migration. Uh, some cloud vendors today use live migration as a method to do the upgrade. So it can be used, but uh, it is slow and it also increases the network load. Um, and uh, it's unpredictable in terms of uh, how long it will take. Uh, it depends on the uh, load of the VMs. Uh, and uh, there are some other problems with the live migration, such as if device state is large, uh, for example, GPU might have a large uh, amount of memory, or maybe there is a SSD that is attached. It's uh, local SSD. Uh, it's just, um, not practical to live migrate it to a remote host. And uh, also the availability of the resources is also needed with the live migration. So uh, the labs must be planned accordingly uh, during the update that uh, there, there has to be this backup host where the VMs are uh, migrated to while the current host is updated. So um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, here's uh, the one example of the virtualization stack. So we have uh, hardware, firmware, host operating system, and VMM. So uh, what is uh, light gray is what we want to be able to update during uh, fast local update. So 
it's not necessarily just the hypervisor and VMM, but uh, also uh, the firmware as well, if possible, should be uh, updatable uh, during the reboot while virtual machines are suspended or uh, like maybe some other means uh, reserved. Uh, these are some of the recent uh, publications and talks uh, about fast hypervisor updates. Uh, so it's a hot topic uh, right now. Uh, and uh, there have been some talks about uh, fast hypervisor update in KVM form, but uh, I wanted to bring it to uh, Linux farmers because uh, the way to preserve uh, memory across the reboot is uh, more related to kernel. So, okay, so how can we do the fast local update today? The, uh, the building blocks for that are the following. Uh, KXEC, which in general provides uh, a way to do a fast reboot. You, we skip the firmware, so, uh, no time, uh, we don't spend time uh, uh, um, resetting the memory, uh, resetting the devices, uh, and uh, we, we don't spend time uh, during the firmware reset. Uh, and also KXEC enables uh, the, like a way to preserve memory across the reboot on any uh, server. So the second, um, uh, building block is the local life migration. So with the regular life migration, we uh, migrate the VM from one host to another host, but it is also possible to migrate the VM uh, to a file. But, uh, and another thing is that it's also possible to snapshot the VM. So if uh, VM has uh, um, a virtual hard drive, such as uh, uh, CAO2, uh, it can be snapshot right into the, uh, hard drive itself. But uh, with the local life migration, uh, normally we also, like with the regular life migration, normally we also uh, copy the VM uh, pages, but uh, we don't want to do that if we do it locally because uh, it's just too expensive and it's basically uh, we have to copy all the VM pages maybe to a slow device before the shutdown and then uh, bring them back from the device after the uh, uh, boot. So we want to keep VMs in memory. So, and to do that, we use uh, PMAM, DEX, and DEX enabled file system. So uh, PMAM is actually emulated. It's not uh, a, a real PMAM. So we use a regular, regular DRAM uh, and just uh, specify that uh, uh, this uh, uh, part of the RAM is actually used as PMAM. So across the k exactly boot, uh, it's preserved. Then on that, uh, that then we convert that PMAM to um, DEX uh, device, and then we put a DEX enabled file system on it. And uh, if we allocate uh, any, if we create a new file and then map that file on that uh, file system, we we don't use page cache. We uh, do not double use double memory. We, we just use that uh, file directly. And uh, that's the way we start virtual machines. We uh, start virtual machines with their memory presented as uh, files on uh, this uh, PMAM based uh, DEXFS enabled file systems. Uh, and when we do the live migration, we simply skip the uh, copying of the memory state. We only copy the devices state, such as CPU registers or if there are any other virtual devices. So, uh, this allows us to do the uh, VM state uh, preservation across the reboot. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so here I want to show a small demo um, of uh, that all of that in action. So I'll try to share an external video. So uh, this is uh, this is tested on uh, a, a host that is used uh, in Azure. 
uh, uh, I'll, I started with uh, rebooting it. So we'll go through the uh, firmware first. So this is the firmware and it has 256 gigabyte of memory. And it also has uh, Zion, um, uh, 128 uh, Zion threads. So, okay, so the system is booted. I added some uh, text to the message just to show uh, the kernel boot time. It was three seconds. Uh, and the next, I also show the memory layout. It's um, so we only have uh, 18 gigabyte for the uh, hypervisor itself, but it could be smaller. The rest of the memory is actually PMAP. So we have nine gigabyte and 231 gigabyte uh, uh, as PMAP. So this is just regular uh, DRAM, but we use we used a map mem map uh, uh, kernel parameter to configure those PMAPs. So, and the next thing I run my script to start uh, sample virtual machines. And uh, okay, so here we are booting virtual machines. There are four Windows virtual machines and four Linux virtual machines. And uh, in the bottom right is the console for, the, for our host. So if you see SAC prom, that's Windows. If you see QMX86, that's Linux. And uh, after that, I'll run uh, a script in each of the virtual machines, basically to show the time and type of the virtual machine, and it will ju jump up and down so we can see that uh, there is a progress. So the script is running right now, and uh, uh, we log in into Windows, and uh, Linux login was uh, passwordless. So yeah, so we have Windows, Linux, Windows, Linux uh, intermixed and uh, all of them showing time. And the next thing, uh, I'll do this uh, fast update, which is basically a uh, snapshot all the running VMs and then reboot. Okay, so we are rebooting now. Uh, it takes, I think, a little less than five seconds to do the reboot. And now we are back and uh, all the VMs are attached and continue running. Uh, my Tmux uh, script was a little bit uh, messed up, so the console now is uh, top left instead of bottom right. But uh, you see the uptime is zero minutes, and then the boot time for kernel uh, was 2.7 seconds for, uh, because this was KXEC, it's a little different compared to the cold boot. So uh, this is it for the presentation, uh, for the demo, and I want to get back to the slides. So, um, okay, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, then I don't know how to get back to the actual slides. Yeah, let me try something here. Okay, good. Okay. And I'm going to make you presenter again as well. Okay, you should be all set. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so that demo was uh, using Cloud Hypervisor, it's a Rust-based um, uh, VMM. Uh, the same can be performed using QMU. Uh, I'm not going to show the demo, but this is just a, a data using uh, QMU and uh, fast update. So on the same server as uh, uh, the previous one, it takes 5.4 seconds with QMU and uh, on uh, my workstation it takes 2.5 seconds. So, so the next thing uh, is I want to discuss about what we use to preserve memory. So we use emulated PMM, and uh, the truth is uh, PMM is uh, works very well because. In addition to KXEC, it actually can be preserved across, across the uh, worm reboot. If we reboot through the firmware, but the firmware is taught not to reset memory. And also the firmware taught to, uh, like, so for example, if it's a UEFI firmware to 
uh, mark the PMEM regions of DRAM uh, to be type 7, then Linux will uh, magically recognize that uh, DRAM as PMEM and will use it just the same as if we used the memmap parameter. Uh, the same is true for U-boot and device tree. We can do the PMEM node, and uh, so and ARM firmware can also be taught uh, to do the warm, re warm reboot and not to reset memory. Uh, and uh, and then uh, there is a kernel parameter choice which can be used on any machine, but uh, unfortunately with MemMap we cannot really do the uh, warm reboot. reboot. We can only do the key exact reboot, and thus we cannot really update the firmware together. Uh, during this update. Uh, the problem uh, with uh, PMAM is that um, there is, um, first of all, this is not a real PMAM. This is just a regular uh, DRAM that is uh, marked uh, as PMAM. And uh, in some uh, parts of the code, we even uh, refer to it as a legacy PMAM. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's very useful to do uh, to, to be used for this kind of uh, hypervisor update, so I don't think that it should really be uh, legacy. But the second problem with this is that it's not uh, portable. So, for example, you cannot really expect uh, admin uh, like when you reserve uh, this number of uh, huge pages. For example, when you do the QHTL, you just say, "Okay, I need this amount of memory to be reserved as huge pages." But if you want, for example, 90% of your system memory to be uh, used as PMAM, uh, you cannot do that using the MEMAM parameter. You have to specifically uh, tell kernel which uh, part of uh, memory is going to be used as PMAM. The, the physical memory must be contiguous. So there, is, there must be like this intimate knowledge about the actual uh, host and uh, the configuration is, is not portable to, uh, uh, to a different machine. So it's, it's, it's not uh, something easy to maintain. Uh, so these are the problems with, the, with using PMM uh, for, for, for this kind of um, use case. And uh, I just wanted to see if there are any suggestions of, uh, what can we use, but uh, still being able to preserve across the firmware reboot if possible, uh, or maybe uh, improve the interface of how we um, create this uh, uh, legacy PMAP parameter. So for example, uh, instead of using this uh, MIM map, we would add a new kernel parameter, which, said, which would just specify the number of uh, gigabyte that must be reserved for the PMAM. So uh, any suggestions? Oh, welcome. Oh, I was going to say that the, uh, the MEMAP parameter is pretty, pretty terrible. Um, we do have the soft, soft reservation attribute now that at least that one only converts known memory and not just kind of ra random things. Um, I think that what you're talking about is this type seven, right? So reservation in uh, UEFI, or is it something else? No, the, 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 the type is, is for contiguous, contiguous stuff. The uh, EFI memory SP uh, special purpose att attribute is, is, a, is, a, well, is an, it's an EFI attribute, not a type. Mm -hmm. right. So when we've done a live update for Zen, we've actually not reserved separate memory at all. Um, and the handover protocol that we use for live update in Zen gives a breadcrumb with which essentially leads to all the live update, live migration state, which has to be re-ingested in the new Zen, but also um, essentially a list of pages it's allowed to use. And we do kind of guarantee that it's going to have at least a big contiguous chunk that it can use to get started before it's got a proper allocator. But then it just ingests the rest of the pages into its mm -hmm. allocator that don't happen to have guest memory in. Um, and I don't know that I would advocate that. It's certainly not we do, not what we do for our live update of Linux. We, we do live update of Linux in a very similar way of just sort of mm -hmm. everything outside. Yeah, the, 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 go on. Uh, preserving any pages uh, worries me. Uh, uh, 
because of the possible uh, memory fragmentation and issues during boot. I mean, it's it's really hard to test uh, if like, once memory is fragmented that uh, the next boot is going to be successful. Um, but uh, what you are saying uh, is interesting too, uh, to have a predefined number of contiguous chunks uh, like guaranteed to be available. So basically uh, have something uh, guaranteed, like, so we should be able to successfully boot just with those chunks of memory and uh, everything extra is just added uh, later during boot. Indeed, yeah. So we, what we've done is we, in Zen, we've reserved a slot for a live update, which will hold at least another Zen kernel and, and enough of what it needs for its early boot allocations. And then each live update will bounce between those two conti contiguous slots in memory. I think we eventually did it that way. But um, yeah, it, it's not quite as trivial to do that in Linux. Um, yes, Yes, so, um, great set of discussion topics. Uh, one other topic I wanted to add here, and you and I have talked about it quite a bit in the past month, is most of the clouds are moving in a direction where we want to project more and more hardware into the guests. And how does this uh, you know, scheme work when we have, you know, uh, physical devices being projected, whether it be SRIOV or complete DDA, into the yeah. cast. I'm curious to see what other cloud vendors are doing there. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and uh, I'll talk about that. That's my next uh, uh, discussion topic okay. is uh, preserving device state across the reboot. And uh, that's also part of the uh, of, of this interface. So I, I would like to use the same memory as we use for uh, virtual machines uh, to be used for the device state preservation. So, but uh, yeah, let's let's me let's move to the to today, and we can combine the discussions of both of these topics. So, uh, preserving device state across uh, the reboot. Uh, th th there was some um, work done in this area. Uh, so Jason Zhang he presented this uh, uh, last year at the KVM forum, uh, and uh, I worked uh, with. Uh, his code and uh, ported it to the uh, latest uh, upstream kernel and uh, uh, experimented with that as well. So uh, that code uh, works uh, with uh, Intel IOMMU and uh, it doesn't work with uh, any other types of uh, IOMMU, but um, at least uh, just for the Intel IOMMU, what is preserved is, uh, so we have uh, posted interrupt tables and then uh, there is uh, some soft data structure for those tables. So the difference between tables and soft data structure is that uh, soft data structure can move uh, when we, so we can actually uh, have a package and uh, copy it during the, before the shutdown and then uh, re uh, recover the package to uh, somewhere else uh, after the reboot. But the tables, they uh, must stay in place. Uh, and the same for the IOMMU page tables. So they must stay the same place. So we have uh, VMX tables and data structure. We have IOMMU page tables and uh, data structures. Then we have uh, interrupt remappings, uh, soft data structures, PCI, soft data structures, and uh, VFIO PCI, soft data structures. So it's uh, really a spaghetti of stuff that we need to preserve uh, uh, be, uh, to, to, to be able to attach back to the uh, device that was directly attached to the VM. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Jason was doing, he used the PKRAM, to, uh, which is the next topic uh, in this uh, microconference. Uh, to, to preserve this um, uh, data structures and also uh, the uh, fixed tables. Uh, but uh, again, at least the fixed tables, they might add the memory fragmentation issue. And uh, uh, alternatively, it would be nice if drivers had uh, a way to allocate um, page tables directly from the PMAM device. So we would have, oh, from a file on a DEX file system. So uh, where the 
VM's memory is saved is uh, exactly uh, in the same place we would have the device states saved. So everything would stay together. Um, and that way we could also preserve the device states across the firmware reboots, not only through the KXX, because today uh, only KXX is supported. And uh, I'll, uh, uh, I see the raised hands, please. Bilu? Uh, Velu, uh, you, you raised your hand. Okay. Um, so, are there any uh, comments about uh, what can be like uh, what can be done uh, as a way to preserve the device states uh, directly to the DEX file system? instead of uh, using the kernel allocator and just uh, allocating from anywhere in memory. So what's the minimum that actually has to be preserved? Um, for start, if you have assigned devices, one thing you can do is quiesce them. Well, maybe, depends on your device, right? Um, and that gets easy because you don't really need to keep anything going during KTEC. If you have an assigned device that you cannot quiesce, you actually need to keep all its mappings valid at all times during KTEC. So even when the new kernel doesn't takes over the IOMMU, you have to do so such that the device will never take a fault. Um, and you can do posted interrupt and point it to an interrupt table that, and that's all you have. It's not really linked to a, a running VMCS, right? That's exactly how it, it is uh, currently implemented uh, using the process interrupt. That's right, and uh, the devices uh, which uh, uh, sh should be touched during uh, boot and uh, they have this flag uh, keep alive past, uh, uh, and that flag is uh, parsed early in boot, uh, and um, so the, the drivers which skip the initializing the device. So we have hacks to the IOMMU driver to make it allocate from, yeah, essentially from PMAP or from our hacked version of. We're also doing kind of mandatory access control there for managing that external memory so that we make very sure that one guest cannot get at another guest's memory with, um, mm -hmm. and the access control for that is, is built into the management system, which we need to sort out and post upstream. So how that uh, hack works? I'm not aware of that hack. Uh, which one? The in the IOMMU? Yeah. Basically, we've hacked a few cases to conditionally yeah, allocate from the guest persistent memory um, instead of kernel memory. So the way we do it is we essentially imagine taking a box with lots of memory and booting it with memory equals two gig. And Linux only mm -hmm. does memory management on the first part of that. And that's why we posted some patches. I was talking about this in the chat earlier about um, making KVM take just a, a PFN instead of a struct page for lots of things um, mm -hmm. so that you can use essentially external device memory, which is fundamentally what right. we're talking about, except we right, do it right, differently. Right. Um, but yeah, we've got hacks to the IOMMU to make it use um, IOMMU page tables from that same memory. There's a chunk of memory for a guest, and yes, some of that is the guest's actual memory, and some of that same slot is used for the guest's page tables and other stuff that's going to be need to uh -huh. going to need to be preserved over KXEC, including user space gets to store some stuff there as well um, uh -huh. for its own essentially large migration state from one boot to the next. Okay, well, yeah, that's interesting. I'll take a look at uh, at that and see. Um, and another thing is that VMX would need to be extended as well to uh, to save to the guest memory as well. And um, but yes, if we were able to uh, to allocate uh, directly from like the tables, if they were allocated from the uh, guest memory or from the PMAM memory, then the the other the soft data structures uh, they are fine. They can be passed from one key exec to another key exec or or yep. using the like, firmware, firmware because they, they're movable, they're, they're, they're not yeah. issue yet. So we don't do that in VMX, right? We treat it like a live migration. Um, ultimately, live update is, I, I keep thinking of it as live 
migration in time instead of space. Instead of going to another box, you're going to the same box later. So all the kernel, KVM state, is serialized. It's all serializable for live migration anyway. So you just use a space, sucks it out, and puts it in the shared memory, the persistent memory, and then consumes it again. It's just like a live migration when it starts up again after, after the KXEC. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have aspirations to get the kernel involved here, because do you really need all those CPUs to do your KXEC? Can't some of them still be running guests while one or two of them are off doing the KXEC? Well, um, that's, uh, <laughs> yes, that's practitioner, yes. And that's what I was also um, looking into, basically. Uh, do not do the DMX if, if you have a, a, like an actual hardware partitioning and let the VMs run uh, during the reboot without suspending the VMs. Uh, I think that it's not uh, feasible today because we do so many VMXs, uh, but... Uh, uh, but that's okay, because some VMX is on the so you don't take much to do, so you could run those yeah, yeah, yeah. essentially with a run loop. And, and yeah, other VMX sets would be a heavyweight one, and yeah, basically that thread ends up blocking until the real kernel comes back. But uh, I think if you've got is. decent hardware set up, you shouldn't be taking that many VMX sets, and um, you could get quite a lot running. I totally agree. So if it's a uh, lightweight uh, VMX, then just handle it during the reboot, but if not, uh, then suspend uh, the VM or the thread until uh, the new kernel is up. So uh, let's. Uh, I also see Dan asking in chat: Is uh, PM uh, suspend resume suitable here or not? So uh, Steve Sester talked about this uh, during, uh, during uh, last KVM: is uh, to have an agent in uh, in the VMs. Uh, to suspend the hardware uh, prior to the reboot and then uh, resume it after the reboot. So uh, that's uh, a, a good approach. Uh, it just uh, relies on this uh, extra agent inside the VM, so it's, it becomes not uh, VM transparent. And also it uh, relies on the workload of the VM and that VM implements the uh, power management uh, uh, stuff correctly for for the attached devices. So that's um, so, so it's 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 not, it's not ideal. Uh, I mean, the ideal solution would be that we are able to do the fast update and not worry about what kind of code is running in the VM at all. Hi, Pasha. So your last point seems to suggest that the device state should be preserved um, in the emulated PRAM. So, and then why don't you do it the other way around? You preserve the VM memory in PK RAM instead. That seems to be more flexible than uh, emulate PRAM because like you said, you have to configure it um, early so, during. Uh, the reason why uh, not preserving it in PK RAM is because we lose the ability to do the firmware update with, uh, if, you do, if you use uh, kernel on the data structure. Uh, and the second is that uh, the memory fragmentation uh, adds um, the complexity, the test complexity that uh, we might just fail to boot the next kernel during like next boot. And uh, there is a work workaround for that, uh, as mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, to have some contiguous memory preserved. Uh, but um, uh, I I'm still worried that. Uh, like on that, that uh, fragmentation could bite us elsewhere. So, uh, so that was for directly attached devices. And then we also have virtual functions. So if a device is sliced and we have several virtual functions, uh, how do we preserve the uh, state of such device? So today, uh, all the virtual functions are handled by the hypervisor itself. And uh, there is no good uh, approach to save, I mean, and the state of the virtual functions is all in the uh, device driver. So there is no uh, a generic way to preserve uh, 
the, the state across the reboot without actually modifying the uh, dri uh, specific drivers for, for the specific devices. Uh, and uh, one way to solve that is uh, actually to move the uh, the handling of virtual functions to I/O domain. So start another virtual machine, uh, directly attach devices to that virtual machine, and then uh, use uh, the devices from a, that uh, virtual machine as uh, uh, to, to handle the virtual functions for the VMs. So uh, again, this is uh, this is not ideal, but I wanted to see if we could uh, brainstorm about. Uh, this and see what uh, if there is anything better that we, we, we could uh, to preserve virtual functions. I'm not sure I quite understand the problem. Um, so the problem. Not yeah, I, I will repeat the problem again. Sorry uh, for interrupting. So the problem is that uh, with the past three devices, uh, we, uh, like in the previous slide, when we preserve uh, the device state, we are not worried about the driver itself. So it's just that uh, the state of uh, PCI, VFIO, uh, interrupt, uh, remapping IOMMU and VMX, these subsystems need to be preserved, but not the driver itself. However, if we have a, a virtual function, then the driver is involved as well. And we need to uh, have a driver to preserve the state in addition uh, to all of that that, uh, that is preserved for the regular uh, pass-through device. Gotcha. Or at least in particular, you need the PCI subsystem of the new kernel not to reset it and turn off all the VS. Uh, well, th that's that's true too. Uh, so the uh, the keep alive uh, flag should be passed to a a like a every device in hierarchy to like to cover that like last node that is preserved. Yeah. So for the general case, I'd actually like to be able to pass a packet of arbitrary information um, from a driver running in the first kernel to the incarnation of that driver that runs in the next kernel, right? And that will accelerate KXEC, regardless of um, hypervisor stuff, right? Fast KXEC from one kernel to the next. Um, and it means that the driver in that new kernel will not need to enumerate and reset the hardware and get it into a known state. It can consume the state from the previous driver or look at it and say, screw you, I don't trust that version of the driver, I'm going to restart the hardware anyway. And that would cover the the SRIOV status as well, potentially, right? So we could pass that across from one kernel to the next with all the information about the VFs and, and essentially the PF driver state. Well, yes, if we um, ditch drivers, uh, about this update. Um, I was hoping we could uh, do something uh, driver independent, but uh, I guess it's not a problem as well. If we are talking about the cloud system, then uh, the number of um, drivers that need to be supported is actually not that large. So we could actually uh, specifically extend this, uh, the, the drivers only for the uh, devices which are part of the like, specific cloud. Yeah. I mean, there are some that don't really need much driver support in the PF anyway, right? Um, mm -hmm. and we've actually extended VFIO to allow SRIOV on VFIO devices for, for us because we didn't need it. But yeah. Okay, so, uh, and the last topic that uh, I wanted to uh, quickly touch is uh, multi-root updates. So basically, uh, I've experimented about, uh, with uh, booting two uh, Linux kernels on the same host uh, simultaneously. Uh, so uh, the idea is that uh, you say uh, you have 256 gigabyte of memory. 
uh, have the first uh, 8 gigabyte for the first uh, hypervisor, second 8 gigabyte for the second hypervisor, and the rest of the memory is for the uh, virtual machines that are running on this host. Uh, and uh, use, uh, like being able to uh, pass the running VMs from one hypervisor to another one uh, using the same method as what we do with the KXEC. Uh, would basically uh, allow us to do almost instantaneous uh, update of the hypervisor because you you sort of switch from A to B uh, partition. And uh, today it's uh, the, the way I experimented with that is basically I uh, modified the key exec to uh, not to shut down the current system as it's normally uh, does but instead uh, return uh, but the start a new kernel uh, on the cpus which are offline in the current kernel and uh, use uh, use memmap parameter to teach the uh, second kernel about what memory it can be it can use to boot so that's uh, that's basically something that is for the future improvements but i think it has a lot of uh, a, a lot of potential because of this ability to so, do this. How did you deal switch. with the, the devices? Uh, how, how were the devices shared between these two kernels? At what? Who so, the... uh, right, right. So uh, the, the devices, like the second kernel, uh, shouldn't, uh, like when it boots, it shouldn't touch any of the resources that the first kernel uh, uses. But uh, as soon as the first kernel is done, so as, as soon as the second kernel is like fully booted and is ready to accept the uh, virtual machines, the previous kernel uh, suspends them and uh, and tells the next kernel to okay, you can pick up the work from from here, and the second kernel just basically resumes the VMs and the uh, and, and and also. Uh, captures the device handling for whatever devices were attached to the to those VMs. So basically it's it's very similar to the uh, KXEC case, just, um, uh, just we just don't have to wait for the second kernel to boot, so we uh, we safe on that. I, I guess if 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 the if we teach drivers to participate in this protocol, then the problem is a much more tractable problem. Uh, David was talking about a, you know, a state packet that could be handed over to the new driver. Um, yes, uh, uh, we can teach drivers, that's, that, that's good. But uh, uh, again, the page tables, uh, if it's expensive to recreate those page tables, um, uh, that's not something that uh, we, we want to reinitialize so that uh, whatever we, uh, the, the package of information that one driver uh, from old kernel passes to the new kernel, uh, it should be able to also pass this static information that was already allocated for the device. And hopefully that uh, uh, that memory comes from that uh, shared pool of memory, such as PMEM or some, some, somewhere else. So, um, Okay, I think that uh, we are out of time. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pasha. Thanks very much, Pasha, and to all the people who um, participated in the discussion. We'll go on another um, fifteen-minute break now, and we'll come back with Anthony's talk on PK RAM. Okay, how about now? I can hear you fine, Anthony, now. All right, excellent. Let me get some video going here. Okay, start again. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Snaga, uh, and I'm going to talk about PKRAM, which we just heard mentioned a few times in the last presentation. Um, basically, what it is, is a way to preserve uh, memory pages across KXEC. Um, it provides an API for um, coalescing the you know data as, as a stream of bytes or uh, in-memory page data. 
Um, one example that I implemented in, in the patches um, was a way to preserve the data of a TIPFS file. Um, so the page data preserved as pages and uh, you know, the file attributes preserved as a stream of bytes. Um, now, you know, wh what this is, what this provides uh, over some other options is flexibility. Um, you don't need to determine a, a size in advance um, and can configure, you know, physical memory, um, and, you know, as we heard about for emulated persistent memory, um, those things you don't need to know, you can just, you know, preserve what you need to preserve. And, you know, from the previous presentation, you know, we, some use cases uh, became clear, you know, obviously live update of, of a cloud hypervisor. Um, this can be used to preserve a guest VM um, across a reboot, both its data and guest memory and auxiliary guest data, which of course uh, was discussed. Uh, such things like the IOMMU data and other driver data can be preserved. Other possible use cases, you know, uh, preserving database block, cache, block caches, uh, and I'm sure there's others. Limitations. Now, these, these are, uh, there's some limitations, um, especially concerning Posh's work. Um, you know, well, one of them is that the preserving and restoring does add or can add a negligible amount of overhead. Um, you got to walk those pages in, in store PFN, things like that, as opposed to uh, persistent um, or emulate persistent memory where everything is just where you need it to be. Optimizations can help there. Um, that's something I did in the patches as well. It's proof of concept. This, of course, does not work for firmware reboot. Uh, you know, this, this is only for k-exec of one kernel to another. And as Pasha mentioned, you know, there's possibility of failure uh, if you get overly fragmented memory from you know, preserving bits and pieces all over the place. You know, I, I do believe there's, you know, implementation solutions to this, you know, either by constraining uh, uh, allocations to certain areas or, you know, defragmenting, things like that. Um, another is that, of course, your new, the kernel you're booting to has to know about uh, but with the data it's getting from PKRAM and how do you get data from PKRAM. Uh, another is that certain things can't be preserved yet, it's like huge TLB pages, um, for example. And uh, I'm sure there's others, but those are the, the primary ones. Current state of, of the patches. You know, I, I sent out an RFC V2 a while back. Um, it's got an API you know, and supporting functionality. You know, for example, it, it works with uh, kernel or address space layout randomization. You know, uh, the, the randomization still works, just it just has to be taught to uh, not stomp on uh, anything that's preserved. Um, you know, I implement a, a, there's an imp implementation of a simple uh, method for preserving tempfs files with PKRAM. You know, somewhat incomplete, but it's it's a good proof of concept. And uh, you know, a number of optimizations um, to sh to show that uh, speeds. Not performance is not necessarily going to be an issue. You know, paralyzing the work, uh, deferring initialize, initialization of page structs for preserved pages, things like that. And then finally, here we are. Uh, questions or comments? I mean, I, I just briefly went over everything, but if you want me to get in more details, I can. Um, so Anthony, you mentioned that uh, one of the solutions was to uh, like uh, preserve the memory uh, that is going to be used for PKRAM uh, in in order to avoid 
uh, fragmentation issue. But uh, if that memory is preserved, I mean, we could just as well use uh, PMAM uh, in PKRAM, and then uh, the reboot reform way would be supported. <coughs> Yeah, that's true. You know, I was thinking out the top of my head, I, I think there's other potentials like uh, uh, limiting how many pages can be preserved, uh, perhaps, you know, percentage of overall memory or, uh, you know, I'm just throwing out things. Um, or, or, you know, if you find it's really fragmented to, to defrag it. Well, I mean, Defrag does not really work because we cannot move those pages that uh, are preserved as page data. Okay. Right? It's just. Uh, well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, yes, some should not be moved. Like, you know, if you're preserving um, IOMMU, uh, certain types of IOMMU data. Uh, others, though, like uh, a regular uh, tempfs file, um, it can't, you know, you can move them. In fact, you know, there's functionality, uh, you know, to, to avoid being clobbered or, 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 or by KXEC or having KXEC clobber preserved pages. Um, there is functionality to get preserved pages out of the way of where KXEC intends to um, locate its uh, KXEC segments. Um, and we've, when uh, preserved pages are found in that area, uh, they can be just, you know, we just allocate a page that's outside of the area and copy it over um, for a regular file page. That's not a problem. Um, in fact, you know, if there's a huge page and it's in in a bad area, you know, we just break it up and and relocate it to base size pages. It works, uh, you know, for data that doesn't have any. Uh, dependency on its location. So I would say that's actually a limitation right now uh, with PKRAM is that uh, certain data, uh, there's, there's potential you could be relocated um, when you don't want to be. So, so yeah, so what I'm looking for is, uh, I mean, it sounds like there's some interest for sure, um, is uh, uh, where to go with this next. Um, you know, the APIs, an, an API of some type seems useful here. Um, you know, are there elements of this implementation that just aren't, aren't going to do it, uh, or the APIs, or in, you know, can this be morphed into something usable? Well, uh, in, in my opinion, um, if uh, the, the, the interface uh, is, is good in terms of uh, you, you have this uh, uh, start setting data, then you select it's, it's a stream of bytes or uh, actual pages that are not movable. But uh, if uh, PKRAM could be uh, extended to survive across the firmware reboot, it would be much more appealing. I see. So of course that would mean involving the firmware, um, but sure, you can definitely look at that. Uh, well, I mean, it, the firmware does not have to be modified today, but uh, the point is that uh, the, the, there should be a way for uh, firmware to uh, preserve the PKRAM data and uh, the interface we have today with, uh, to, to, to work with firmware is the PMAM. So mm -hmm. eventually uh, the PKRAM sh should be able to use the PMAM. Okay. So for the Zen version, we actually ended up moving away from a command line parameter pointing the new kernel at you know, the, the stored memory. And we mm -hmm. put that in, we have patches upstream for kexec and a different type of kexec, which passes that root pointer, we called it the breadcrumb, um, from one 
kernel to the next through coexec, which made it a little more versatile because you could have things that were changed after that coexec set things up. Because there's a difference between the, the coexec uh, loading the kernel and setting the command line, setting up all its regions, and then the, the final coexec. So something might have changed. So okay. we ended up with with a completely in kernel handover for that, which we could hopefully use from Linux as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. And if we're going to use this kind of mechanism for, for passing driver state from one kernel to the next, it really is going to have to be in kernel, some of it, you know, updated at the last minute rather than things that can be passed over because they were put there by user space, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, and one of the advantages, at least with the command line, I'm so assume passing it through KX that can be do the same thing. Is that the compressed kernel? You know, obviously has access to the command line as well, or any, and can um, do what it needs to do to to support KSLR and things like that. Yeah, well, we had the opposite problem that, that we had to pass it through. I think we ended up putting it in a register somewhere, and and then it had to be passed through. Um, but it, it meant we could do more. Um, we, we started off with it in the command line for, for Zen, um, and mm -hmm. ended up ended up moving it to the KXAC handover. So we can possibly manage to reuse that same thing because KXAC is basically the same. You can KXAC from Zen to Linux and vice versa. Mm -hmm. We did hypothesize about doing really stupid things like KXEC from Zen to Linux and then have Linux resume the Zen guests, <laughs> given that we can now run Zen guests on Linux. But we haven't got there yet. Okay. So I, uh, I'm, there's interest in an RFC version three, I take it. You know, I, I think I'm going to probably have to, you know, uh, put things out in smaller pieces. Um, you know, and leave out maybe the proof of proof of concept type code. Um, so it does add up to a lot of patches. I'd love to see my generic so that um, the tempfs is just one thing that can be passed across the generic mechanism, mm -hmm. and that lets us then expand it to do, you know, individual con device drivers can do support for passing their state over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. You want a trivial device driver to start with, just pass over the loops for Jiffy, right? That's one thing that the new kernel takes a long time doing if it's not passed over explicitly, and it's utterly pointless if the old kernel could have told it. Okay, that's a good idea. Any other comments or questions? Uh, if not, I guess thank you. Um, we can have 15 minutes back of your time. <laughs> thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thanks. So we'll be back in 15 minutes for the NumaWare spin-off talk. All right, so I'll make you presenter again, and I got your video and heard your audio, so uh, you're free to start whenever you'd like. All right. Um, 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel. So, um, hello everyone. I'm Alex, and uh, I'm happy to participate in this micro conference and have the opportunity to talk about our work on uh, numeral locks and the corresponding patch set on adding numeralness to QSpin lock. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that this is a joint work with uh, my colleague Dave Dice from Oracle Labs, and uh, unfortunately, I think Dave um, couldn't be here today. So um, I would like to start with a very brief uh, introduction to the topic of uh, locks and uh, NUMA, although I assume that most of the audience here are familiar with the topic, but uh, just to make sure everyone are on the same page, I'll go very quickly over those slides. So locks protect access to the shared data and uh, remain the most popular synchronization technique, perhaps uh, despite the rise of other alternatives such as non-blocking synchronization, and uh, even though people know how to implement locks for, I guess, more than 50 years at this point, um, they still remain the topic of extensive research. And uh, the main reason for this attention is because um, it's well known that the performance of parallel software and the Linux kernel um, included often depends on the efficiency of the locks um, it employs. So locks come in uh, many flavors. Uh, we have exclusive locks that allow only one thread uh, in the critical section at any given time, or we have reader writer locks that allow multiple readers to be in the critical section at the same time, but only one writer can acquire the lock for write at the same time. And then we have spinning and blocking locks, and the uh, locks that uh, differ in the uh, levels of fairness, uh, fairness guarantees that they provide. The focus of this talk is going to be on exclusive fair uh, spinning lock. Um, also known as the Q spin lock in the kernel. So the last thing I want to mention in this brief introduction to locks is that uh, locks evolve with the evolution of computer architectures, and uh, we live in the era of uh, multi-socket architectures, the so-called NUMA effects. And so if you have um, software running on, on such a system, if you want to take advantage of, uh, of those uh, NUMA effects, we need um, NUMA wear locks. So what is NUMA? Uh, well, in modern multi-node uh, systems, access by a core to local memory or local cache located on the same uh, node is faster than accesses to a remote memory or a, a remote cache located on a different node. And this is known as non-uniform memory access effect or NUMA in short. And note that even if a system has um, a single socket, it may behave like NUMA on a die we are accessing certain memory or caches faster than the other. But if your system has multiple sockets, it's pretty much guaranteed to have those um, NUMA effects. So how do lock uh, designers explore the effect to construct better NUMA by locks? Well, the general idea is to keep the lock ownership within the same node. That is, when a thread wants to release the lock, we want to make sure that the next lock holder will be running on the same NUMA node. And by doing that, we decrease the number of remote cache misses and internode communication. So note that this happens not only on the lock state, but also on the data access in the critical sections, since threads competing uh, over the same lock tend to access the same data or closely located one in their critical sections. At the same time, it's pretty clear that by keeping the lock within the same uh, node, we cannot guarantee strict FIFO. And by strict FIFO, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, uh, strict fairness. And by, by that, I mean FIFO. And in general, uh, those numeral locks tend not to be fair over short periods of time. However, most of them, most of those numeral locks usually preserve fairness over longer term, uh, switching periodically between NUMA nodes. So uh, all in all, numeral locks um, tend to trade off short term fairness for better performance. Now, before I describe how our, uh, our patch set modifies a QSpin lock to bring NUMA awareness to it, let me spend a minute to talk about QSpin lock itself. So, uh, spin lock uh, in the kernel is one of the most basic types of uh, locks. It's ubiquitous and present in many internal data structures, such as file inodes and page structures. Um, and as such, it has to be very uh, compact as any increase in the size of, uh, of the lock structure would immediately increase the memory footprint of, uh, of the entire kernel. And it also has to be fair, although I have this uh, question mark next to the question whether it needs to be FIFO, and 
we'll get into uh, into fairness um, uh, discussion hopefully later in the slides. Um, and it obviously uh, needs to perform well on the all levels of contention. So those are some of the requirements for uh, for spin locks in the kernel. And now, now let's see how um, spin locks uh, achieve them. So on the first kernel, spin locks, uh, uh, the spin lock was implemented as a test and set lock, which is the simplest kind of lock you can imagine. It is very compact and fast, especially for the no contention case, but it is not fair. And in fact, may cause starvation for threads trying to acquire this lock. So later on, this lock has been replaced with, with the so-called ticket lock, uh, which is also compact. It's fair. In fact, it, it uh, provides a FIFO, um, but doesn't perform well under high contention. And finally, about eight or nine ye uh, years ago, the ticket lock has been replaced by a Q-based lock, hence the name Q-spin lock. And to be more precise, Q-spin lock today is a combination of a test and set lock for the, for the fast pass, for the no contended pass, and the so-called MCS lock for the uh, slow uh, contended pass. So MCS stands for the Merrill and Scott, uh, who are the two authors who invented uh, this algorithm. And it's a very popular user, uh, user space Q-based uh, spinning lock. So the resulting Q-spin lock in the kernel um, is, um, is fair and performs well on the low and high contention, at least when those NUMA effects I described before are not uh, present. And when they are present, this lock doesn't perform well uh, simply because it's not NUMA aware. So one of the main reasons I think that numerous uh, NUMA aware locks from user space haven't made their way into the kernel so far is because those locks are typically built of a hierarchy of NUMA oblivious um, uh, locks. And as such, they tend to use space proportional to the number of nodes. And this translates into hundreds of bytes of, uh, of uh, memory on a typical multi-node system. And it, it goes far beyond anything that would be considered reasonable in the kernel. So uh, a couple of years ago at this point, we came up with this idea called the uh, CNA that stands simply for compact numeral lock. So um, CNA requires just four bytes of memory, pretty much like the existing Houston lock or just one word uh, when implemented in user space. It's a variant of the NUMA oblivious MCS lock uh, that I mentioned before, and it has uh, several advantages in, in this regard. So first of all, it inherits its performance features of MCS, such as local spinning and just one atomic operation per acquisition, uh, and also requires uh, relatively minor contained changes to existing MCS implementations, including the one in the kernel for the Q-spin lock. Now, performance-wise, and I'll talk about performance uh, uh, more extensively later, but uh, in, on a high-level summary, it performs on par with MCS under no contention and on par with state-of-the-art hierarchical numeral locks when contended. Now, this latter part, we, of course, could e evaluate only in the user space since those uh, hierarchical uh, numeral locks, as I mentioned before, are pretty, pretty large. But in general, when we compare the... Um, and the, the existing kernel with the one that has our patches, uh, we can measure up to 3x throughput increase on a highly contended for node system. So how does CNA do that, or what's, what's the trick? Um, and um, I guess on a very high level, so queue-based spin locks, such as MCS, organize waiting threads into, well, a queue. So the thread at the top of the queue uh, right here uh, we'll have the lock and all other threads will uh, join the queue and spin on uh, on, uh, certain, on a certain field in their uh, queue structure and wait until the lock becomes available to them. Now, TNA uses two queues instead. So it has the primary queue for threads lying on the same node as the lock holder and the secondary queue for everyone else. So in this example, if covers represent the uh, NUMA nodes on which uh, threads are running, we'll have um, blue nodes on one, uh, sorry, blue threads on a one NUMA node and red threads on a, on a different NUMA node. And we want to keep log, um, uh, uh, passing the log between those uh, blue threads. Now, how we do that. So uh, MCS log holder checks whether the next waiter in the primary queue is running on the same NUMA node. And if not, it, it detaches that waiter from the primary queue 
and moves it to the tail of the secondary one. So schematically, that would look like that. So if we have um, in this example, uh, uh, the, the blue thread number one holding the lock, when it wants to pass the lock to its successor, it will check and find that its successor in the main queue is a, a red thread. So it runs on a different node. It will move it to the tail of the secondary queue and pass the lock to uh, its successor on the main queue, right? So we'll keep the lock as, as, uh, as desired. Uh, uh, we'll pass it to another thread uh, running on the same Numa node. So of course, if we uh, keep doing that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, just to add, so we gradually filter the primary queue, leaving only uh, waiters running on the same preferred Numa node in the primary queue and moving everyone else to the secondary one. Now, of course, if we keep doing that um, all the time, we will have the issue of starvation. And at this point, uh, you can ask, well, what happens? Um, with the fairness or, uh, or FIFO. So the high level idea to ensure uh, long-term fairness, um, we flush, we want to flush the secondary queue back into the primary one after a certain period of time or a certain number of uh, internode handovers. And uh, there are uh, several ways to achieve that. And we went through a number of uh, options uh, and based on the feedback we have received uh, on our uh, patch series, we settled on the following. So uh, we will keep track of, uh, of the time since uh, the secondary queue has been created when the first th thread has been moved into it. Um, and after a certain time has passed since, uh, since that moment, uh, we will flush the secondary queue based uh, back to the, to the primary one. And of course, there is the question how much time so it's a tunable parameter and uh, the default value is uh, uh, one millisecond, but it can be tweaked on the fly. So it doesn't require to restart uh, uh, the system if you want to, to uh, modify that. Now in general, of in a- um, just, um, Sorry, just, just a quick note, note for that. Um, users are gonna get that entirely wrong every time. Um, in my mind, it's always better to, to leave this, these kind of decisions uh, one for, 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 for all users, um, just do it underneath and don't let the user even be aware of that. Okay, thanks. Thanks uh, for this uh, comment. Um, so uh, in general though, this, uh, this parameter, either visible or not to the users, it's, uh, it, it, it controls the trade-off between 5.4 or you know, short-term fairness for, for better performance, much like any numerical log um, has. So one thing to mention here, again, based on the feedback, we added this uh, notion of uh, prioritized threads who are excluded from uh, this uh, scheme. So for example, if a thread attempts to acquire the spin lock with IOQs disabled, it will be prioritized in the sense that it will stay in the primary queue and will not be moved to the secondary one, no matter the numa node on which it, it is running. So, um, so yeah, uh, now let me talk about uh, uh, some performance results. We have uh, integrated um, CNA into the slow path of QSpin lock. We also evaluated CNA extensively in the user space as well, comparing it to MCS and some uh, state of the art hierarchical numeral locks. So I'll talk about results from a four socket um, X86 uh, based system with 18 hyperthreaded co uh, cores per socket. Um, so here is a, um, in this chart, we compare the throughput of one of the benchmarks in the wheel uh, scale suite of uh, benchmarks for the kernel. And this benchmark creates contention on, on the spin locks uh, in the kernel. And we can see that once we um, increase the load um, beyond 16 threads, the throughput of the original kernel drops while CNA manages to keep the throughput stable and maintain the gap of um, more than 2x in this case. And up to 16 threads when, when the contention is not significant, uh, CNA and stock perform pretty much uh, the same. Now, interestingly, uh, CNA um, can help accelerate user space applications that happen to have contended p thread locks. And it achieves that by increasing throughput over the field exchange underlying those locks. So in this example, the throughput of, of this uh, well-known key value store uh, level DB 
improved by almost twice uh, when we apply the CNA page to the kernel and no change to the application itself. Um, so we have um, a few other results uh, in, in the page set description itself and also on the mailing list, uh, some of them posted by, um, uh, by the kernel uh, test robot. So here are a few examples of, uh, of those um, uh, results. And uh, in, a, in a quick technical summary to CNA, so by achieving the efficiency of MCS at, at low contention and performance of a uh, state of the art numerical blocks at high contention, um, I think CNA is attractive and, uh, and a compact alternative for any numa oblivious lock, and in particular to MCS. And the L page that introduces CNA into the slow path of the Q spin lock is available at this, uh, at this link here. And uh, I want to uh, spend a few minutes to talk about this uh, page series in, um, uh, in more details. So it has uh, already undergone 15 rounds of a uh, uh, a review so far, and here is here is my opportunity to say a big thank you to everyone who provided feedback and and the uh, evaluation, especially uh, Wayman and Peter if they're here, um, uh, who reviewed this uh, page series extensively. But also thanks to everyone else who has uh, chimed in, and of course more feedback and evaluation results are welcome. Um, I think the main hurdle that remains in the is uh, this hovering question on whether we re really need this. Or if I only slightly paraphrase one of the comments, shouldn't we be spending our time breaking those contented locks instead? And uh, this is a fair point. And uh, my answer to this is that uh, we should probably break those contented locks regardless, since if we can rewrite our software to avoid lock contention in the first place, we should do so. But uh, at the same time, more efficient locks help us to, to buy time for such a rewrite especially when such a rewrite is a, is a um, tough option, such as the case of legacy software. And even then some locks might be inherently contended, such as when everyone wants to update the same file at the same time. And so the lock protecting that file would be hard. And in the mid, uh, meantime, as our results show, um, if we keep ignoring NUMA, we, we leave essentially up to three X performance on, on the table. Yeah, sorry. That was I have other questions. Um, yeah. yeah, so I I think uh, uh, this helps to uh, improve the the average uh, throughput, but I'm a little bit concerned about the worst case uh, latency that uh, this might um, cause um, because uh, I think you put the tunable as one millisecond. If we have a four right. socket system, say the worst case might be I have to wait for three milliseconds say, before yes. I could actually acquire the lock. So I, I was just wondering, like, if you have maybe done some workload that 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 look at the the latency aspect. Yeah. So you certainly you're certainly right that. Um, that's that's the trade-off. Uh, one thing to point out is that uh, when you have contented lock, you will have be waiting for for that lock in the queue, no matter what, right? So with this patch, you might wait uh, longer, just because you know you might have um, contention coming in from uh, one NUMA node and uh, and uh, threads running on a different NUMA node will will have to wait a bit longer, but. But yeah, um, I guess we haven't looked specifically uh, into the worst case performance, but it certainly can, uh, um, you know, can increase in the sense that the, your your waiting time can increase. Yeah, that's 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 a fair point. Hi, um, I, I would like to add that um, um, for RT real time tasks they are treated at prioritized so that they won't get re killed into they go, won't get killed into a secondary queue. So uh we will keep all the real time tasks uh, in the primary queue. So um so yes. for portals that are latent sensitive I, I suppose they should be running with real time priority. Uh, in that case it won't get affected by by this. Yeah. Yeah and the and the other yeah, and similarly uh 
preempt RT is, is going to have to disable this because of the it went, Ross Spinrock said, I mentioned it yesterday and went one um, uh, determinism and they want that that first in first out semantics. In addition, there's a class of real time applications that uses no hertz full. And they're going to be spinning potentially at normal priority, not real time priority, uh, but the only thing on that CPU. Uh, but you'd want them to have uh, privileged access to the lock, nonetheless. Maybe you just say, "Go ahead and make them run RT," even though they don't, even though they don't need to. But there might be some side effects of that. So something, another use case, a real time use case to consider the the case where you have a CPU bound real time thread running on a single CPU is the only thing there. So is is there any way to identify those um, threads or tasks? Yeah, um, uh, there's some in kernel primitives that you're going to hand a hand a CPU to that'll tell you whether the CPU is in that state. Oh yeah. If you know uh, if you know the CPU. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Paul, for this comment. And uh, I think it it shouldn't be. If you, if you send me an email query, I'll get the actual thing to you. Or there's people on the call that probably know them off the top of the head, but I'm not one of them. Okay, sounds good. We can certainly add them to this uh, priority list, especially if the if the query is a uh, lightweight and wouldn't improve, wouldn't you know have any impact on performance. Um, and in general, I think um, uh, for for everyone who who uh, you know asked uh, those questions about worst case uh, latency, if you have any suggestion for uh, for benchmarks. Who care about worst case latency? It will be. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to to do more performance analysis and uh, and um, you know and analyze the the sensitivity of uh, of those benchmarks to to this uh, tuning parameter. Um, I, I, yes, uh, I'm concerned about one thing. Uh, so the linked list, the primary linked list that you have to go through and modify. That has a, a combination of things from different human nodes. So you end up requiring remote human node accesses at some point to go through that primary list, right? So, yeah. so the, what I'm concerned about, uh, or or what I don't see is why is this a requirement uh, for uh, the, so the the space that the lot takes? Why is it a problem to multiply that space by the number of human nodes in the system? Uh. I'm not sure I um, I understand the question. So you're asking why we don't just inflate um, the lock and and use one of the hierarchical locks instead, or yes. Uh, well, so this uh, so we don't change the the uh, Q spin lock uh, structure, right? So um, the existing Q spin lock um, has uh, only four bytes. And we use essentially the same four bytes for managing the lock. Uh, those hierarchical locks uh, are typically, you know, they need hundreds of bytes of memory just because you want to pair those um, structures to avoid uh, full sharing on the access to, to um, you know, to those locks that uh, or to those threads lying on different NUMA nodes. And I doubt you can uh, put. Oh, so so that becomes a memory layout problem, which can be solved in other ways, where you could basically put all those locks into a per human node uh, uh, memory area, and then use offsets to to to. We do that for per CPU data at the moment in the kernel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it might be um, th there might be a way to. To do that, uh, it will probably introduce more changes to the existing uh, Q spin lock. Uh, but um, yeah, tell me. Because then the advantage you get is as long as you are within, uh, uh, so as long as you're local within the NUMA node, uh, nobody need to touch any NUMA uh, memory from uh, remote uh, NUMA nodes. Uh, until that ticket, let's say, gets moved to another human node that controls the lock, and then everything becomes local to that human node, and then somebody else get, gets the another human node gets a lock. So you basically bash the accesses by human node, uh, and get everything local within a human node by using a, a hierarchical 
memory layout. Yeah, so uh, the thing to note here is that um, you do touch um, the structure of, uh, of a remote thread, but only once when you move it to the secondary queue, right? And that's why you need this, uh, you know, period of time, one millisecond in, in our case, to reap the benefits of, of doing this reorganization, right? So that your next access is to the successors in the, in the main queue will be all local. Okay, so what you're saying is uh, uh, accesses to remote new memory is is really uh, uh, rare. So it's only let's say each millisecond uh, you you get to touch yeah. other uh, remote uh, new lines. Yeah, 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 exactly. So once we move this uh, this red thread to the secondary queue, right? It it won't appear in the main queue until we flush the secondary queue back into the main queue, right? And so we will transfer the lock. We will filter. The primary queue and we leave essentially only waiters on the same NUMA node. So during this filtering, we might access, uh, sorry, we, we might touch those remote structures, but it's done only one and at uh, once and, um, you know, in aggregation, that's a very, a very small overhead. Yeah, but I'm thinking about use cases where you have short lived locks, you have a, a primary queue filled with, uh, with entries from various NUMA nodes, and then you end up, each time you need to t take the lock, you need to move away uh, uh, lock uh, entries that belong to different NUMA nodes than yours. So you end up always doing remote NUMA nodes access. So it has a, a worst case scenario that's relatively bad. Uh, well, it will be as bad as, uh, as the current uh, Q-spin lock. Yes, but I think you could do better if you go for a distributed uh, locking uh, hierarchy. Well, I, I, um, I guess, I mean, uh, that, that's a fair point, but uh, I need to think more if you really can, you know, implement this hierarchical lock in a way that uh, would, you, you wouldn't have to access uh, remote structures and, uh, you know, be compact enough to, um, to, to, to be integrated in the camera. Yeah, thanks. So one, one thing I, I think that would, would add more value to, to, to maybe starting to get this upstream or, or, or whatnot would be, um, I, I know you have a, a, key, a key store a benchmark that uses Futex, I believe. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm just seeing micro benchmarks, um, which really aren't that interested interesting, uh, considering if you want to add uh, the, the complexity you want to add into this, like you really need solid numbers. And I think people would, would, would be more more drawn to um, higher benchmarks, um, e even benchmarking your, your own database, uh, Oracle, like if you provide the results with that, um, basically just run more higher level workloads on it would be interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, just like I said before, um, if there are any uh, concrete suggestions for for uh, workloads with, with container blocks, uh, I'll be happy to, to uh, give them a try. Um, yeah, but certainly uh, more benchmarks will help. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't need to be a, a workload that only pounds on a lock. It can just be a generic high level workload. Since spin locks are everywhere, like it's it's bound to, even, even if it doesn't show any difference, like it would still be interesting to, to see what, what shows. Okay. Yeah, so some of those uh, benchmarks, um, I mean, I do agree they're, they're pretty small, but some of those, especially in the in this uh, mailing list, I think they do would would be counted as, you know, more significant. I think those AM7 and FSMark um, are more uh, interesting than what uh, probably um, uh, you can find now page uh, description. Have you tried the uh, TPCC? Like, uh... 
I because I, I think for our TPCC teams, uh, when I look at their profile, they have quite uh, quite a bit of uh, spin lock contention there. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. we haven't. Thanks for the suggestion. Right, so this is my uh, last slide with a bunch of uh, links to, to resources, including paper that we uh, published at URC a couple of years ago, and uh, a free copy is available on archive as well, and uh, some of the, um, some of the um, links to, to things that I mentioned during my talk. And uh, again, thanks for the feedback, and uh, if you have more, feel free to reach me with um, my email. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, that brings the end to, to, to the, the track. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, participating. Um, and thank you again to our sponsors. And have a good rest of your day.